Hello and welcome to The Last Word on Spurs, our Christmas special. If you're listening to the show for the very first time, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify and Audio Boom. We're across a range of different audio platforms. We are, of course, on Twitter at Last Word on Spurs. We're on Facebook and Instagram too. And no, I'm not looking at Anthony Costa whilst I do this intro for being put off. We're also live, of course, on YouTube as well. I'm delighted to be joined by the whole of the Last Word on Spurs panel for this very special show. And my God, the positivity is literally ramping up as we speak. Some of us, like myself, have bottled the Christmas outfit. I will apologise in advance for that. We've got a very special ex-Spurs player joining us, one of our favourites. He made a total of 209 appearances for the club, providing 16 goals, 30 assists for our beloved Tottenham Hotspur. He established himself as one of the most po- promising young English central midfielders in the Premier League towards the 2006-07 season. And under head coach Martin Yole, compared him with the German legend Franz Beckenbauer due to his playmaking abilities of a ferocious shot power and versatility. He also played his part in coming on as a substitute as we beat Chelsea in the 2008 League Cup final. Still our last trophy to date, don't mention that. And during the 2009-10 season, he became a regular under Harry Redknapp, featuring for the club in our first ever Champions League campaign, along with scoring some real beauties, including his time and goals against Man City, Arsenal, and a crucial goal against Bolton to keep us in contention for a Champions League place. Delighted to welcome back to the last word on Spurs, Tom Huddleston. Tom, lovely to have you here. Thank you for joining us. How are you? No, I'm good, thanks. Uh, Thanks for having me on. Um, Obviously looking forward to the show, but yeah, no, I appreciate I appreciate the offer of coming on and looking forward to it. Amazing. Listen, Tom, we're pleased to have you here. And it's uh, funny, Tom, because I said the last time or the first time we contacted you, it's fair to say there's a different manager in charge. I wasn't quite sure how the format of this show would go. But I think it's fair to say the last few months, we have simply been riding the wave. I'd say last few months, last four or five weeks, I'm already getting carried away. I've known Conte's been here. But um, Spurs have already got themselves in a semi-final. We've already got ourselves knocked out of Europe, which to Jason McGovern, he can't wait to celebrate that fact, which we might still be going back into it, Jace. You might have to calm down there for a second. And we've still got an FA Cup, like I say, run to go on as well, and also competing for that top four, and who knows what more. So um, to talk you through who we've got on this show tonight, from we'll go from left to right. We've got the brilliant Frankie Major. No party, no major. He's in the house. Frankie, how are you? I'm all good, mate. Um, I was saying earlier, it's, it's always best to do these these shows um, off the back of a win. Um, got the Elton John Christmas glasses on. Um, legend Tom Huddleston. Love Tom's time at the club. Very, very fond memories of Tom. So let's go. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. And also, like I say, alongside uh, Frankie there, making up our right wing back spot on my screen, we've got Jamie Brown from the Daily Hotspur, who's recruiting us, hopefully a right wing back at some point, depending on Emerson Royale's form. How are you, Jamie? I'm oh, very good, thank you, Ricky. Yeah, really excited to speak to Tom. And uh, I've actually got my uh, Danny Rose Christmas jumper on tonight. So look at that. I mean, I'm technically. I think I'm. I think I'm in the left. I left that spot. So yeah. Now looking forward to this one. Looking forward to this one. Can I just say, Dave, as you just said, Danny Rose, Jason's face, we can't zoom in on 4G on this screen, but it was an absolute picture. And at Tom's delight at seeing one of his own there join him in that centre of defence uh, was superb. Um, on the left wing, who, uh, like I say, he's listen, more capable than I am of doing these kind of shows in terms of hosting real legends, of course, like the likes of Tom Huddleston. We've got the great Richard Cracknell back. Rich, how are you enjoying left wing? How's it, how are you finding it? Yeah, I'm slotting into the role, getting getting used to it. You know, I'm more of a utility man across the back four. But, you know, when, when you've got a good gaffer to play for, you, you'll slot in anywhere, wouldn't you, Rick? So, uh, but you know what I'm really enjoying about this evening? Not only Frank Major's glasses, but his audio feed, because he sounds like the World Cup 1978 commentary when it used to be done <laughs> down a phone. And it's giving me real, real vibes of nostalgia back to them days, Barry Davies or uh, the da- down the phone commentating on like, Argentina versus Brazil. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm loving that this evening. Merry Christmas, everyone. Absolutely. Merry Christmas to you all. And I say thank you so much for tuning in. Now, um, in the centre of our, of our midfield, proudly sponsoring Papa John's in the background. As you can see, we've got Tungyun Dumbele's uh, playmaking assistant there in Jason McGovern. Jace, how are you enjoying that centre of midfield role? Going to do some work in there for us tonight? Yeah, you've given me the Ndombele role, so I'll probably leave after about 60 minutes and uh, not to be seen for the next month. But uh, yeah, looking forward to this, mate. 
Yeah, the comments that we're having, unfortunately, this is a fixed formation of a 4-4-2. We can't change to the 3-5-2 of the Conte favourite due to the nature of the uh, device that we are using for this system. <coughs> if we can change formation throughout, we'll be sure to let you know. Um, Jason's midfield partner tonight, like I say, um, doing the dirty work alongside him, we've got the great John Wenham, who runs the Lily White Rose pod. John, how are you? Hello, Rick. Yeah, doing really well, mate. Thanks for having me on. Absolute pleasure to be on with Tom tonight. One of the sweetest strikers of the ball we've ever had in N17. Loved that goal against Arsenal. Even better was a celebration. Cool, calm, collected. Loved you, big man. Great to have you on. And uh, yeah, Merry Christmas, everyone. I'm buzzing for tonight. Absolutely. Buzzing for it. And listen, my co-host, the man of the Conte crazy train, operating on a right wing tonight. You know, we're expecting the train to pick up some pace on that side. We've got the wonderful Lee McQueen. Lee, how are you? Stuck out there on the right wing, hugging the touchline, getting the crosses in as and when I can. I'm loving the 4 4 2. Absolute pleasure to talk to Tom Huddleston. Um, I actually met Tom uh, back in the day uh, with, with, uh, with a Man of the Match award that I, I once gave out um, in the boardroom at White Hart Lane, which was absolutely amazing. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a fun fact for you on that. So, brilliant to have you on. Absolutely buzzing to see all of you, all of all, all of the people together on the screen. It's so awesome. And uh, looking forward to getting into it with all the comments as well. So, fantastic, Luke. Absolutely. And like King Hoddle says there, McQueen will be using that pace down the right wing. Don't you worry. He's just getting started. Now, um, we have gone for two up top. Um, on the left of that, we've got the brilliant, who runs a great YouTube channel over, um, Chris Cowling. Chris, lovely to have you back on last one on Spurs. How you find yourself up front tonight? Will you get that service from that midfield with Jason behind you? Are you confident? Well, with Jason and uh, Crackers behind me, you know, we've got, to, we've got to get some balls and we've got to, you know, cost her up front as well. You know, we're going to score a few tonight, aren't we? But pleasure to be on tonight and absolutely pleasure to uh, have Tom on tonight. So, Tom, thanks so much. And, uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. And there's so much positivity in there at the moment. And uh, the trophies have got to be coming, haven't they? Oh, They're coming, absolutely. Chris. They're coming. Seven minutes, 23 seconds, or to, or to Chris's tone there, uh, 45 seconds into his speech, the trophies have to be coming. Joining Chris as he's exposed there up top is our man over in that right uh, forward spot. Of course, listen, from the big boy, Bland Blue, and one of our own, of course, on the last one on Spurs, Mr. Anthony Costa's in the house. And you enjoying that forward role? Yeah, I'm loving it, mate. I feel like a bit, I don't know whether to be a bit of a Vincent Janssen or a bit of a Soldado, do you know what I mean? Um... But I'll be getting the goals. Don't worry about that. But listen, Tom, lovely to meet you. Lovely to see you, mate. And thanks for coming on the show. And uh, listen, mate, I've got a lovely, jubbly Christmas, mate. I'm a Fools and Horses fan. Love it. Um, yeah, let's, let's crack on with it, boys. And Tom, thank you for your time, mate. Absolutely. Listen, we're looking forward to it. It should be a fun show. We're going to try and include as many comments as we can. It is a night to pass and it isn't just to say that with what's going on in the world right now, with all, like I say, um, the serious stuff out there, this is hopefully for you an hour of escapism, a bit of fun, a bit of joy in what's been a great last eight or nine weeks for Tottenham under Antonio Conte. We can have a bit of fun on last one on Spurs. We can kick back and enjoy. And we've got the great Tom Huddleston helping us do so. Now, Tom, as I said, for me, it's a real pleasure to have you back on last word on Spurs. At the moment, you're back at Hull after a period out of the game. How are you finding your time at the club? Yeah, no, I'm thoroughly enjoying it at the minute. Um, it's been a bit of a tricky season for myself on a personal level. Um, I somehow managed to... I did my hamstring, which is like the almost the first muscle injury I've had in 17, 18 seasons. So that was frustrating. And it was actually on a day that the manager sort of said... I'll rest you for this game, just train with a few of the lads and make sure you're ready for the weekend. And yeah, I did my hamstring then and then redid it on my first game back. So that's been a bit frustrating. Um, but nah, after not having a club last season for the full year, for the first first time since leaving school kind of thing, um, it's just nice to be back into a, a regular routine and almost have something to focus on and targets to achieve because uh, there was times times throughout last year where it would have been easy for me just to think, oh, I'll just call it a day and stuff like that. But I still feel I've got a lot to give, whether that's from a playing perspective or el helping the younger players with certain bits and bobs or coaching if needs be. Um, so I still feel I've got a lot to give and sort of this season has reassured me that it was the right decision not to hang the boots up. Tom, you were out of the game for a year, as you just said. What were you up to for that year? And sort of how did you keep your fitness levels at top level so that you could come back into pro football straight away after? 
yeah, that that was a tricky bit as well because obviously with all the the pandemic stuff. Um, so when at my, my back end of my time at Derby, um, I think we had a ten ten week lockdown. So the club had given us maybe like a six week program to stick to uh, via email, and you had to record all your runs. Um, so when I was without a club, um, I was sort of sticking to that again because I knew that put me in a good fitness place in the first place. So reverted back to that and then just tweaked it here and there as and when um, I wanted to increase things or decrease things. Um, like a lot of people, like I got into road cycling, which was the first time I've ever done it, but I, I did quite enjoy that. Um, and yeah, well, managed to bring my golf handicap down from 13 to six as well. So that, that was the only bonus from not having a club for a year, really. Um, but yeah, it was just a case of, especially at my age, you know know what your body needs and you know where you need to be ready for when you do get a club. Um, so I was able to use my experience and knowledge of different exercises I've managed to do throughout my career and managed to try and keep myself in as good a shape as possible. Tom, we've seen the likes of uh, Ledley King, Dawes, uh, Kino, Jermaine Defoe, Jermaine Jenis go down the coaching or media route. Um, have you any plans to follow and what would you prefer, coaching or media work? Well, I actually did my coaching badges probably four or five years ago. Um, and when I was actually doing it, I loved it. And I'm sure you can see, especially with Conte at the minute, if, you, if you're a manager or coach and you see something that you've worked on in the week come off in a game, like it's one of the best feelings and that was just me doing my badges so there was no relevance to the outcome but to get that adrenaline rush was exciting but obviously media work is probably the the easier sort of route to go down mentally and almost physically as well I guess but um, I've said this for a couple of years I would like to maybe combine the two um, one of my friends who's at Derby now Liam was senior I think he was managing Brighton under 23s and he had two days in the evenings with Sky Sports as well which that would be an ideal scenario to be honest to, to keep one hand in, in both and sort of not pigeonhole yourself into to one area because I think in both aspects I think I would would do fairly well and from the little bits and bobs I have done for, within both industries I have, I have thoroughly enjoyed both of them to be honest. He, he speaks brilliantly, by the way, Liam Messina. I'm sure he's really well. time yeah, of punditry. Very intelligent that. football man. Um, very but, much. But, so. but, but, but Tom, look, looking at us, and obviously a lot has gone on so far this season, but what have you made of the season to date? I think, obviously, with Nuno coming in, it was always going to be difficult in terms of how long it was left in the summer. Um, normally, most clubs you're going to get your top two or three targets, you'd imagine. Um, but by looking at the reports, Nuno seemed to be sort of seventh or eighth down the line, which wasn't ideal. Um, and not being funny, I, I played against his Wolves team in the Championship and they were unbelievable. But I just thought the last two years that they become a little bit predictable and not the most enjoyable to watch. I don't think it was really going to be the perfect fit. Um I think the last last few weeks under Conte, you can see a real direction. The players seem, I don't know if it's fitter or just they know their their roles in more depth. So they, it appears that their fitness levels are higher. Um, it, it'll be more demanding on a day-to-day -day basis, which will in, increase that intensity on a day-to-day -day basis, which inevitably uh, transforms to games. Um, we've seen Harry Kane look look back to himself in the last few games as well. Um, so I think it's exciting times. Into the semi-finals last night, as you mentioned before, FA Cup still to come. Hopefully it's a blessing in disguise getting knocked out of the Conference League or whatever it's called. Um, yeah. And I'm sure... <laughs> well, I, I, think, sure. Tom, they, I think they want to try and get us back in it now. That's the problem. I think they're trying to push us back in it. We're, we're trying to get out of it and they're trying to get us back in it. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you a question, Tom, just before Jamie comes in, just on um, Nuno? Because obviously, interestingly, when a manager is subject to potentially leaving the club, there's always that uh, terminology is, uh, you know, he's, he's lost the dressing room. I just wonder, as a player like you that have 
I hope you don't mind me saying this, has been around the block. You know, you've played in many different football clubs and dressing rooms. And um, as a player, does it get to a point where you just know it isn't going to work, regardless of what you're being asked to do on the pitch and what you're being instructed to do? Yeah, I think it does get to, it can get to that stage. Um, but my interpretation, when they say losing the change room, it's as if everybody's against the manager and people would rather lose rather than win for his satisfaction. But I don't think it ever gets to that level. Uh, but there are times where you think these tactics aren't going to work. However hard we try, if we stick to this game plan or tactics, then we're sort of, well, I can't say it on here, but we're we're losing a fighting battle, so to speak. And does that, just, sorry, sorry to interrupt as well, but does that, does that change in different dressing rooms, like different managers? Do you have like a captain that would maybe, or some of the senior players, Tom will go and have a conversation maybe with a manager, say, look, you know, this ain't working, we need to change it, or, you know, does it depend on the type of character the manager is? I can imagine with Jose Mourinho, for example, I'm obviously speculating, I don't think anyone goes up to him and says, your tactics don't work. But do you know what I mean? Like this, it's, And again, going into coaching and management yourself in, in the future, it, it's going to be something to, to, uh, to think of, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's one of them where a lot depends on the dressing room as a whole. Uh, I think, like you say with Nuno, if you're a younger player and you're playing, you're going to give 110% to try and stay in the team yourself. Whereas if you're a senior player and there's a few of you who are thinking these tactics aren't going to work, you might take your foot off the gas a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Majority of clubs nowadays probably have, I know, Arsenal have used it recently in the press, but like a leadership group. So the manager will, every few weeks, will speak to five or six of the more senior players um, and get their opinions on things. Um, and that would be that would be a chance for the players to to speak up to the manager in a open environment rather than if you go up to a manager one on one and say, Gaffer, I don't think this system's working or that. A manager might take a bit of a Back step, but if you've got five or six of you in the room and sort of he poses the question to you to get your opinions, I think then that's a good opportunity for the players to relay the message from the rest of the squad and just say, "Could we do this better? Could we do that better?" Um, and little bits like that, which I think that's the way the game's going. A lot of managers are leaning on the experience of some of the players because maybe not Jose so much, but a lot of the other modern managers. Um, happy to take input and understand that they're not 100% right every time. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Brilliant. No, 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 left after 12 games, Tom. Do you think he got long enough? Were you surprised that 12 games in, we, we pulled the plug that early? And were you surprised he even got the job in the first place? I was surprised at all of it, to be honest. I was surprised <laughs> he got the job in the first place, uh, to be fair. Um, but then it's one of them once, once you give someone the job uh, 12 games is definitely not enough for them to fully implement all their ideas um, if you think after the first three games of the season he, he was manager of the month and Tottenham are sitting top of the league and everything looks rosy uh, so you think nine games after that and he's lost his job is is a bit of a surprise um, but it it wouldn't be in my thinking, obviously, Daniel Levy would have been seeing what was happening at Old Trafford and thinking Antonio Conte is still out there. A couple more losses at Old Trafford and they could be pulling the plug with Oli and going for Conte. So it's probably one of them where he's thinking as much as he wants to give Nuno a bit more time, there's not many managers of the calibre of Antonio Conte that are on the market for, for long enough. And obviously all the bits and bobs go, go on behind the scenes where... Conte, would you fancy the job? Blah blah blah. Yes. So, I think I think that might have played a big part in his early departure. And that that Man United loss was was re realistically it was actually a good loss for us with uh, with the looking like the battle of the sack on the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Exactly. Um, if it had gone the other way, you wouldn't you wouldn't be surprised if Conte was the manager at Man United now. Um, so sometimes you've got to take a step back to take two forward and that loss to Man United 
and the appointment of Conte not long afterwards uh, seems to have benefited Tottenham in the longer run. Just going to go oh, over to yeah. Jamie because we missed we just oh, missed yeah. Jamie's question out. I'm going to go to Jamie, then we're going to go to uh, so over to you, Jamie. Yeah. Um, so one thing that we've really seen with with Conte so far, and I think in particular in the West Ham game last night, is that a lot of players seem to have benefited from Conte coming in. We've seen a lot of players kind of step up in their performances. Um, do you think there's kind of players in this squad that really benefit from having Conte here, or, or and do you think that this squad does still need additions to kind of start challenging for the top four and maybe start challenging trophies as well? Yeah, I still think the club are probably three or four players away from where Conte would want. Uh, with the system he plays, he's, he's massive on, on wing-backs. Um, I, I like Reginald. I think he's, he's looked good since he's come in. Um, he probably maybe needs a bit of competition in that position um, and similar on the right-hand side as well. Um, I like the, the three lads in midfield. Um Skip's been brilliant when he's played this season. Hoiberg has had a, a great Euros for Denmark and continued that. Um, Wink seems to be like he's getting more of an opportunity. And obviously with the system, sometimes Conte will play three in midfield and two up front, or he'll play the, the two midfielders and two number 10s, um, which wasn't it last night. I think Lucas Moura, um, I forgot the other lad's name that scored, I can't pronounce it anyway. Um like, yeah, but I think that's I think that's benefiting them being in that slightly more central role rather than yeah. being stuck out wide. Um, it's more more of an involvement in the game. You're closer to goal. You're closer to your main striker, which will only benefit Harry Kane as well. I'll hand over to Ant now. Ant, over to you. Yeah, Tom. Obviously, Conte's banned ketchup, which we all all know about, much like Ramos did back in the day. Now, is there more acceptance nowadays of dietary requirements? And also, how much of a struggle was it when uh, one day Ramos brought it in? Um, you can be honest here, some of us. Everyone goes <laughs> on about it, Tom. Like the whole place. Yeah, no, you know? I think the when one day brought it in, it was literally, it was just changed overnight, which is why the lads were, were not confused, but were like, yeah. is it really point? Like, is it really worth it? Normally, you would sort of filter filter it out of the diet at the training ground. But yeah, I think there's such fine margins in the game nowadays. Yeah. Um, I think every little aspect needs to be have the most sort of care taken to it as possible. Um, being fit and healthy, being available for the games is, is one of the main things, um, especially at the moment. So obviously with, with Conte's history, I'm sure he's, he's done that at other clubs. Um, and his track record at them other clubs speak for itself. So if he's doing something that works, I'm, he's going to always continue it. Um, and with the results and performances, it seems like the lads are buying into them ideas. So I'm sure they'll buy into all of his ideas. Can I just say, boys, my Christmas dinner has been delivered. Courtesy of the boys, <laughs> I have my Papa John's pizza, which is a lot better than that domino slush. Chase, can I ask a favour just for um just for the watching audience right now? Can you zoom us up to uh, your your wall there, just to show us that art you've done we can, earlier today? We've got a bit of artwork on the wall. Look. <laughs> Tom, Tom, I'm not sure if you saw it, but Domino's Pizza put a tweet out when Tottenham were kicked out of the Europa Conference League, and it was basically m mugging us off. It was it was mocking yeah. the club. And then Papa John's came in and stuck up for us. So it was like a little standoff between Domino's and Papa John's over Spurs. Very, very you, random. Papa you John's losing. is nicer anyway. Yeah, <laughs> there you Good go. Good lad, John. Good lad. <laughs> Are you listening, Domino's? Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's delicious, boys. Absolutely delicious. Loving it, Jace. Loving it. So, so Tom, let's talk goals. Let's talk football. Um, get, get ja back Jamie, football. Hold on, Jamie Brown's got his Christmas present as well. I've sent him. Here we go. Oh, a, that's very go one. Oh, 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 no, no, no. It's got to be, it's got to be a full size one as well. Oh, it's a full size. It is a full size. <laughs> I've got a mini. Exactly, exactly. The good recovery stuff. Well, what was the Happy Meal? <laughs> yeah, I've been a Happy Meal. Exactly that. So look, we got burgers. <laughs> Rick mentioned in the intro, Tom, uh, the, the goal that you scored against Arsenal. And I just wanted to uh, um, have a conversation with you about 
you've scored some some fantastic goals, two great half volleys against Chelsea and Arsenal, actually, in the 4-4 and the 3-3 draws. Uh, over kind of, you know, um, recent times, Chelsea, the rivalry between Tottenham and Chelsea got a little bit more, um, I suppose, more heated, shall we say, battle of the bridge, etc. Which of those two sides, for you personally, meant more to score against? Obviously, Arsenal or Arsenal, right? But I, I just wondered whether or not, you know, it, the, the Chelsea, with that competitive edge as well... It, what made what was uh, what was um, uh, what was better for you? Uh, who did you um, think you had that? I would say at the time, and it might upset a few here, um, but growing up as a kid, I was actually a Chelsea fan, um, mainly from like Glenn Oddle's the the squad and team that Oddle put together, bringing in Hullet and Zola and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But once I obviously started playing professionally myself, you sort of well, I've. I know some people do, but I sort of lost that fan. And I was just a fan of football sort of thing, especially once yeah. I moved to Tottenham and yeah. understood the rivalry. So probably the Chelsea one on a personal note, but obviously the history and rivalry against Arsenal was was nice to tick a goal off in, in that game. And they were both relatively important goals, but they were great games that, pop up on Sky Sports Classics um, every few yeah. months. So it's always nice to have a look back and <clears throat> remind yourself of some good days. Crazy Tom, games as well, those two, weren't yeah. they? They were yeah. mental. Tom, yeah. what, was the, what was the best atmosphere? When I say best atmosphere against, say, Chelsea or Arsenal, like, did, did you feel intimidated at all? You obviously going to, going to their ground or going to the bridge. Was you ever intimidated? Because obviously, um, you're away from home. What, what was the worst atmosphere, man? No, I'm never really intimidated. That's best atmosphere, I would say. The night games at White Hart Lane, probably against either one of them, to be fair. I remember before when Azza scored. It? Yeah, but when, when Azza scored, and it was the first time we'd beaten them in two, one, a, one, a lot, a lot the of five years. One, yeah. The 5 1, the 5 1. No, oh, that, two, yeah, one. that fifth, as well. 5th of November, that was Rick, wasn't it? It was fireworks the night. Fireworks night. Edge of the what box. Was the one and he just, I was West Lowell when Hutton hit, 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 was it the 4 0 when the, it hit Carvalho's bat and Keno just yeah. pinned it? Yeah. That was, that was the best, man. Keno got, Keno, got very, Keno got very excited that night, didn't he, in the celebrations? Yeah, he did, yeah. <laughs> Good lad. Brilliant, brilliant, guys. Does, brilliant. Guys. Does our away record play on players' minds, Tom? No, because our, our away record at Stanford Bridge is horrendous. It's wow. not much better at the Emirates. When, when you get ready to play either of those games, are you. Are you, are you aware of that away record? And, and does it have that, that psychological doubt for us? Um, you know what? I think subconsciously it probably does, to be honest. Um, mm. Especially probably more so nowadays. You see the social media and all the stats are everywhere you look. Um, I think my, my early years at Tottenham, Arsenal had a very good team. Chelsea's team was one of the best in Europe for a long time and hardly ever lost at home, regardless of the opposition. Um, yeah. So it was always difficult and I it still sticks in my mind. I'm sure you guys will remember, we were 3-1 up at Stamford Bridge and oh, Martin yeah. Yole decided to take off a couple of the lads oh, to rest them for oh, the next oh, game. Was, it just, was that the FA Cup game? Was it? Yeah. It yeah. Backfired yeah. dramatically. Oh, Sam Farley, wasn't it? Oh, Sam Garley, yeah. yeah. What a goal that was. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That that game, but yeah, day. it was just... Sorry, oh. No, it was... It was frustrating because on any given day, we, we knew and fancied ourselves against anyone. It just... It took a long time in coming. Um, but as I said, the Arsenal team, when I first went to Tottenham in the mid noughties to the back end of that, was was a good um, a good team and a good squad. And then the Chelsea team over the past twenty years maybe have been been quite formidable, especially at Stamford Bridge in general. To be fair, well, they used to call call it three point lane, didn't they? Chelsea, they come from White Hart yeah. Lane and, and know that was going to get the points. And and actually, it was it was your era under Martin Yarl and all, and all the boys that started to change that. Like you've already referenced it. I think we beat them, didn't we? First time, I think when Azza scored two one, and and actually that started to change a bit of a mindset. Almost like certainly with us fans, we were like hang on a minute, we can do this. We can actually go and beat some of the big clubs. And, you know, that that was definitely down to, you know, the team at the time uh, around, you know, that Martin Yarwira and your era, basically. 
just before yeah, we, no, um... we, we always had belief. It was just, as I say, just almost getting the monkey off your back kind of thing and getting that first one out of the way. So all these stats of 24 years and all that, uh, oh, they're thrown yeah. away. You can you can start the next stat now kind of thing. Absolutely. And before we hand over to Rich, um, Gary on the screen there says, happy Christmas to everyone on the panel and in the chat. Good to see Tom as well. Uh, who will we be signing in January? Uh, I promise you, Gary, to answer that question, we are going to come on to that um, towards the end of the show. Um, when I say we discuss a bit more in terms of the squad, what we're looking to do, we'll give you a round up on that. I promise. I'm going to hand over now to Richard Cracknell. Yeah, Tom, uh, evening to you. Merry Christmas. Uh, just to rewind a little bit, um, where I do Q&A nights with the ex-players through from uh, Cliffy Jones and Terry Dyson from the 61 double side, right through to Ledley King and uh, Gary Mabbott and Glenn Oddle. All of them, to a man, say that they always wished, if they did finish a bit early, to carry on playing until they couldn't kick a ball anymore. So, you know, keep playing, Tom. That's all I'm saying. As long as you feel you can offer, a, you know, a good service, keep doing it because like, there's one shot at this. So, uh, yeah, keep playing, keep plugging away, whatever level it is you feel that you need to and uh, don't hang the boots up too uh, too soon. And uh, secondly, uh, just to rewind on the, on the um, issue of diet, Mrs. Cracknell sends her regards. She used to work in Waitrose at Buckhurst Hill. And she said, you always used to come through the till with a nice, healthy basket full of food. So we know that you was looking after yourself back in the day, buying the best fruit and veg and a good bit of food. So, uh, yeah, so she, she sends her regards. She often used to see you coming through the, through the till there. So um, question I've got for you is, if you could have one rule change in football now, what would that be? And apart from Arsenal getting liquidated, of course. <laughs> um, I would like to see uh, probably a time a time frame on the VAR stuff because um, it's meant to be clear and obvious. But if it's not clear and obvious after thirty seconds, then go with it's the referee's decision. It's not clear and obvious, or, is it? Yeah, exactly. Um, have you have you played a VAR game yet, Tom? No, thankfully not. Um, <laughs> you haven't had one yet, but no, not yet. Um, but yeah, it just looks watching it last season and this season. It, from a player's perspective, it looks really frustrating. Um, like the other night, was it? Might have been against Arsenal when Richarlison scored two that got disallowed, and it's literally the finest of margins and. It was a toe, Tom. One of the goals was yeah. a toe. It was offside. It's ridiculous. And even some of that, if if someone's got different coloured boots on, you'd be onside. And if they're bright and they stand out, you might be offside. Do you know what I mean? So, and I don't, I don't think it's ideal that you have current referees doing the VAR as well. I reckon it should be a a panel of experts for the for the VAR rather than a referee that does a VAR on a Wednesday might get a decision wrong and then he might have to referee the same team actually in the middle of the pitch on a Saturday. Um, it'll Do you be know nice what? To Tom see. makes a good point now. That's because because that, if, if like, Jermaine Defoe, who's probably got maybe a size six, seven foot, could be onside and somebody like Carnu that used to play for <laughs> Arsenal, like who I think who threw away the boots and wore the boxes, his feet were that big, <laughs> could actually be off offside. I mean, you could end up like these like Japanese geisha girls that, that like bind their feet up to make them like three sizes smaller than they actually are. It is that's the nonsense of it though, chaps, isn't it? You know, it's like yeah. the foe could be onside and Carnu offside. It's like it's, 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 it's right. Do you, know, you remember Sonny's one against Leicester? Yeah, that Leicester yeah. one. Was yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. His finger, it was his finger. I and you see yeah. it, it was his finger leaning like that. And it's like, how can you show how to run for the ball? He's a striker. Do you know what I mean? Issue, and, I think the biggest issue is, I think you're spot on there, Tom. I think one of the issues is, is that you've got referees that are using the, the you know, the equipment, the VAR and all that sort of stuff. And actually, have an expert do it, it'd be a damn sight quicker and you'll probably yeah. get a more accurate result. Um, and and ex-pros, or ex-pros. Yeah, yeah, or ex-pros. Yeah, 
Now, you look at m &F, for example, like Carragher, Neville, whatever. Do you know what I mean? They're doing all this stuff all the time, like on, on screen, moving stuff around, understanding how it works, ex-pro from that perspective. You know, I think it's it still becomes completely subjective by another referee. He's just using a bit of, uh, a bit of equipment to do it rather than, than him or her telling, you know, his, his colleague that they need to work more as a team. And I think they need to be punished, maybe is a, a too strong a word, but actually... If if they get the if they get the um, uh, the decision wrong, how can they get the decision wrong if they got VAR? But they still get the decision wrong, and the people that get punished are the teams. You know, it could be yeah. three points, or it could be a penalty, or it could be you could be out of a cup competition. This was meant to help the game, not not hinder it. Now, I've been in the stadium, I'm sure, like we all have, and I'm, we're sitting there and we're thinking, or we're standing there and we're thinking. How long is this going on for? Like, you know, how long is this VAR? Like, it, like you, yeah. you don't know what you're doing. Like, you don't know where you are. I remember, was it a game at, was it Wembley, was it, when it was snowing? Um, and we had a VAR call? I can't, I can't, do you remember? Yeah, I can't remember I what, it was. It what was game was that? Four minutes. And it yeah. was like, I mean, yeah. it has got better than that. Rochdale. 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 Yeah. 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 God. Craziness. Yeah, anyway, absolutely sorry. craziness. No, I totally agree. Uh, Tom, out of interest, um, on that point of VAR, do the referees come round to the respective clubs before? The, I mean, I thought that's the case at the start of the season. They do uh, normally chat to the manager. Is there any general chit chat with the players for amongst the season about? Um, obviously, I know you're not involved in the VAR situation, but with referees in general about the laws of the games and how they're changing at all. Well, yeah, they come in and have a chat um, at the start of every season and explain a new few of the law changes or new interpretations of it. Um, obviously, they ask for their respect every year, um, <laughs> which... A bit old with some of those decisions being made. <laughs> yeah, that lasts for about the warm-up of the first game of the season. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, no, nah, honestly, they they come round and it's just like... It's very repetitive, especially the amount of seasons I've been playing. Um, obviously, it's not their fault. They've got to do it. Um but I think the st like the standard of refereeing in general, below the Premier League especially, is is not great at the minute. Um, and that's I've below, seen below the saying, Premier League. Below yeah. the Premier League is the richest and biggest and best league in the world. And I'm not obviously asking you to confirm or not confirm, but for me, the the Premier the Premier League referees are shocking, shocking. I th I think with with the Premier League, like I mentioned, I think. You know, like you've got Jurgen Klopp at the minute who's very outspoken and demanding of everyone and everything. Obviously, they've had their game on Boxing Day called off, which mm. he was sort of pushing for. Um, yep. But if you've got Klopp that's on at a referee on a Saturday and then he's got a VAR, their game on a Wednesday, there's a bit of intimidation there and stuff Absolutely. like that for the next time he's got to go back to Anfield. That's why I think in the VAR scenario... You should have people that only do the VAR stuff, and that's their that's their only job. And as you, as Frank's mentioned, it was very quiet was, last night, clock with the uh, with the challenge by the the other England captain, wasn't it? Oh yeah, he won't he won't speak out about anything like that. But demanding games getting called off and stuff, he he's done that, and it seems that the Premier League have potentially bowed to his pressure. Um, yeah. But obviously, I think the the 26 and playing on the 28th is a quick turnaround, but it is, I'm sure a few years ago, I don't know if it was when I was at Derby as a kid, I'm sure we played Boxing Day 28th, the first, and then the first round, or oh, the third round of the FA Cups, like the fourth or fifth as well. So, yep. Well, that's the, that's exactly the same schedule as what Spurs have got now. At the it's moment, exactly yeah. The We've got Boxing yeah. Day 28th, the first, and then, uh, um, in, in fact, I think it now might be the Carabao Cup semi final. That first, that yeah, first it's level. one of them. It's not. It's, crazy. it's not ideal, but if it's almost tradition, I understand. I don't think maybe that game on the twenty eighth or 29th can be moved later in the year. But I've always liked the Boxing Day and New Year's New Year's Day games. Um, and obviously, if it wasn't for the semi finals, it would be the the sort of the big boys coming into the FA Cup in the first week in January as well. Yeah. 
Well, what we're going to do, we are going to go for our first break of the show for our listeners on audio. Uh, for watching audience on YouTube, as always, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, being joined by, listen, a real fan's favourite in Tom Huddleston and joined by the whole Last Word on Spurs crew here on this Christmas special. Just wanted to again say thank you so much for all your support throughout um, the last year. We know it's been challenging. It's been tough. It's been therapy. It's now positivity and it is now enjoyment as Anthony Costa beams that smile um, in the bottom right hand corner playing the centre forwards role tonight. There'll be goals coming his way. Don't you worry. And Chris is looking like he's a few down on the left hand side. All right. Um, we are going to kick back um, and crack on. We've got lots of Christmas uh, questions to go. So, Tom, um, to you, um, we now head into the Christmas period. And as a player, um, intrigued to know what that's like for you in terms of how much time you do get to spend with the family. And, um, you know, do you ever get a chance to sit down for the Christmas dinner being one? And uh, how many days, albeit several days off before and after, do you have in terms of rest time during that period? Um, for me... Maybe being a bit of a Grinch around Christmas, um, I've always treated it like a normal week or leading into a game. Um, been a few managers I've had that have given the lads Christmas Day off and just trust you to do the right thing. Um, whereas others, they either get you in a couple of hours earlier than normal training, so you, you're back home by midday. Um, or if you've got an away game, you'll come in I don't know, say four o'clock train and then travel to the hotel. Um, but yeah, I think it can just be like a normal a normal week in terms of you train afternoons, evenings with your family. Um, obviously, if you're away from home and you have to stay in a hotel, a lot of clubs will make you meet up in the evening um, to travel. Um, Christmas dinner is normal for most people, but maybe not with all the, the extra trimmings and the desserts and sit there pigging out on after eights or whatever people do. So I think it's just keeping the tradition with your family, but sort of within reason, knowing that you're going to have to be running around for 90 minutes in a few hours. Tom, that's tough, isn't it? That That is tough. Like I know people go, oh, footballers, but they're on like 100 grand a week and it's this and it's that. Like, I don't think people quite get that footballers are also humans. So, you, do you know what I mean? There's there's people with families, and I get that from speaking to the ex-players. You want to be there with the kids, like, you know, yeah. and do these things. And if you've got to go and stay in a hotel, and I don't care if you're earning a tenner as a road sweep or 100 grand as a footballer, it's tough. If if you've got to go away from your family, there, there, there is, there, you know, there's, there's a tough element to that. And, you know... People might dig me out for this, but, you know, if you are earning 100 grand a week, to be away from your kids and family on Christmas night and going to a hotel is hard because that's a Christmas time. That's a human thing. It, it, it really is. And, uh, yeah, you oh, know, yeah. That, that, that is a tough thing. Yeah. It's probably harder, yeah. isn't it, I would think, for the for the foreign lads who are usually having a midwinter break. And, mm. I mean, most of the leagues have packed up. And then suddenly... You get you take a German or a Frenchman or a Spaniard, and suddenly bang! No, you're playing. I mean, you can see that Randnick and that is already starting to moan that he's he's got to manage a game on Boxing Day. Yeah, yeah. now for the foreign lads, as you say, they're used to a few weeks fully shutting down. Probably for a week of that, they can do as they please, sort of dietary wise and spending time properly with their family. Um, for the British lads that are used to it and have grown up playing a lot of games in the festive period. Um, it can be tough. Say you've got a couple of families together and you've got, I don't know, 10 or 12 people around for dinner and everyone's having a few drinks and stuff like that. And they're staying up till two or three in the morning playing the boring Christmas games that they, people do. Um, yeah, it is. A lot of it is all about sacrifice. Um, maybe having a glass of wine with your meal to to celebrate the festive period. But after that, you've got to be sensible. Um, and as I say, knowing that you've got a game in a few hours. 
Tom, what's the reaction towards players that are injured or suspended over the festive period? Are they expected to carry on and come in and train and work with the club and build their fitness up or do they kind of get more time off with their family? Um, if you're suspended, you have you still have to train as normal. Um, I think myself and Jake Livermore had it a few years ago when we was at Hull. Um, and as you say, people are under the assumption that oh, they're suspended, so they get Christmas off. But we had to train as normal. Um, on that day, we we trained in the afternoon and got the coach up to Sunderland. And we had to go and watch the game the day after. So even though we were both suspended, um, we were still training as normal, still spent Christmas evening in the hotel in Sunderland, which obviously is nicer places to be on, on Christmas Day. Um, I think for the injured players... If it's one of them where you say you might be back for the New Year's Day game, you'll still have to come in and get yourself ready for that. But if it's a long-term injury, um, they'll just shut you down and maybe give you a week off with a family or something like that if, it, if you're not pushing to get back soon kind of thing. Tom, I've got, a, I've, got, I've got a Christmas question for you, but it wouldn't be right of me because all the guys know that I talk about trophies so many times on this channel. Um, <laughs> so. Talk, talk us uh, through, you know, winning that League Cup in 2008. And can you believe it's been so long since Spurs have actually lifted a trophy? And surely Antonio Conte has got to be the right man uh, to lift us a trophy, you know, in the next year or two. Well, on that, it would have been interesting to see if Jose would have been the right man the week leading up to the Cup final last year. Uh, but obviously, that's a different topic altogether. Um, but yeah, I was... To be honest, I've, I've said it on a couple of podcasts and bits before. When we won that, I personally and probably as a group maybe took it a little bit for granted in terms of thinking, oh, we've won this. We'll, we'll get back to a semi-final next year or a final and so on and so on, thinking it was going to be pretty straightforward. And obviously we did manage to get back to a final the year after. Um, and we lost FA Cup semi to Portsmouth, which still haunts me to this day. Um, oh yeah, mate, with Dawson, isn't it? Bless him. Yeah, but yeah, thinking I didn't think that would be the only trophy that we won whilst I was at Tottenham. Never mind X amount of years later. So it is a surprise, and some of the teams and managers they've had, especially since I've left, has been. Staggering, really. If you think, I know Man City have been on a ridiculous run regarding the League Cup, but it's not many games to get to a final of a League Cup. Um, so you'd expect, I know it's it's not as prestigious as maybe the FA Cup and stuff, but it's still a trophy. And if, if a manager at Tottenham can just tick that off and like you say, all the stats, like I was saying, with the winning at Stamford Bridge and stuff, all them stats can finally get get thrown out the window and can concentrate moving forward on winning more trophies. But Conte, the way that the team's looking now, um, you would fancy him, but it's four big clubs um, in the semi-finals of the League Cup. So it's going to be, it's going to be tough for any of the teams that are going to go on and win it. Tom, the Christmas question, what can we expect to find in the Huddleston household in the way of decorations? Is it subtle uh, approach or, or are there trees in every room and airport lighting, uh, landing lights in your garden and, and around the house? Um, we've actually got... Yeah, well, the, I hope you've got better few... tinsel than Ricky. I hope you've got better <laughs> tinsel than Ricky. <laughs> no, there's, a, there's a few lights on the front of the house at the minute and yeah, Christmas tree-wise, not down to me. The wife's got I think we might have four in the house at the minute, so it's a bit. Four? Yeah, it's a bit over the top. I know. Hey, Tom, you've got a forest. <laughs> now there's only only one of them's real; the other three are artificial. That's so as that's many league cups as we've won in our history. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do your deal on trees next year, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a Tom, bit excessive at the minute, but it's all good for the little one. Tom, if you're not um, a big fan of Christmas, you want to try living here in Lanzarote, it's brilliant. 
because it's yeah. just palm trees and they play Christmas songs, but it's still like 25 degrees and like feels feels like summer. Never feels like Christmas here. So if if you're not much for one for <laughs> Christmas, come and move to Lanzarote. I can thoroughly recommend it. You'll never ever feel Christmassy. No, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom, I've got a, another Christmas orientated question about kits in your time at Spurs because obviously Christmas is like me, myself, and many of us. First Tottenham kits I, I got were sort of around Christmas time. This Christmas, a lot of kids will be opening their first kits, whether it's sort of baby grow kits, baby kits, or junior kits. Um, in your time at Spurs, what was the, your favourite shirt that you wore, and what were some of the worst? Um, I think the worst was one of them, the Puma Puma ones. They were like with really with a mansion with a mansion on front. Do you remember? Yeah, I think it was. They were really. <laughs> like, they were quite. I swear, <laughs> they were quite baggy. They were quite. <laughs> now that one was alright actually. Yeah, that one's uh, all right. That one's all right. Nothing, nothing wrong with a baggy shirt. Very good for the big guy, let me tell you. <laughs> That's got to be the mansion one, isn't it, boys? Them old sausage skin ones, no good for the big lad. <laughs> What's the, um, yeah, the no, chocolate, chocolate kit? Yeah, was nice. chocolate chocolate, one, chocolate, I really like that. That wasn't my favourite yeah, chocolate I think, kit. I think I made my full debut in that in Europe, actually. Um, yeah, that is a nice what, kit. Maybe Slavia Prague? Or Slavia Prague, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in the chocolate, yeah. That was yeah, channel. That um, was channel five. That was channel five, wasn't it? So yeah. pro- channel five. That was channel five. I did. I know my last season. Um, I like the Under Armour one. To be fair, it was quite a bit longer in the body, um, and the training kit and the tracksuits with it were a lot nicer. But yeah, they, a couple of them Puma ones were quite square and quite short in the body, but quite wide in the body as well. So they weren't ideal. Mm. Uh, yeah, so this is certainly a question I was never expecting to be asking Tom Adelson, but uh, I'm doing it anyway. Um, what Christmas movie are you most likely to watch and uh, what box sets are on your Christmas wish list? <laughs> I think Christmas movies, when, when you see them on, I think, obviously, the Home Alone ones, they're hard to turn off. You end up classic, always classic. Yep. leaving that on if you if you come across it. I can't remember which number, but the Die Hard one is a bit of a Christmassy one. Um, That's the number one, isn't it? It's the first yeah, Die Hard one. First one? Um, first one, Hans Gruber falling off yeah. of an Atomi <laughs> Plaza. Yeah. It's not Christmas till you've seen that. Yeah. <laughs> as as for box sets, um, I'm not sure, to be honest, but I'm a big fan of uh, the Ricky Gervais Afterlife, and I know oh, yeah. Se- yeah. Oh, season yeah. three is uh, the fourteenth of January. Yeah, so yeah it's great, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, it's it's after Christmas, but I'm I'm gonna I'll probably restart season two soon, in anticipation for season three, a couple of weeks into January. Well, I've, just Christmas- finished, I've just finished something called Gamora, Tom. It's brilliant. It's unbelievable. It's like an uh, Italian, based in Naples, Italian sort of. Mafia, it's all the Gamoras, all the gangs in Naples. Five it's seasons. Subtitles, it's subtitles, but I've literally just finished the last one. Unbelievable. If, if you've got a bit of time, yeah, recommend, no, recommend. Plenty of time at the minute. <laughs> cool, eh? Anybody else want to bring any box sets up? Jace, <laughs> you wrote this script just out. Well, you, any, you, know, any, any box sets? I, 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 you know, it's just Guy Sports News box set. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm glad you said- and, and you want to be Jason on the Fools and Horses, isn't you? And bit of Fools and Horses. Bit of Fools and Horses. You know, with Fools and Horses, I don't know about Tom, but when you're away from home, it's quite... I always watch things that remind me of being at home or growing up as a kid and that, and Fools and Horses is the one for me, man. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You can um, always just leave it on in the background as well. That's what I mean. Just, yeah, it's yeah. easy to watch. Leave it on. It's fine. It's good. No. A Christmas morning, what's going on the playlist? We've got a bit of Mariah, we've got a bit of the Pogues, a bit of uh, Slade or a traditional carol, or we ju- just avoid Christmas music and, and avoid blue greatest hits albums and rubbish <laughs> like that. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, all rise business. I probably won't have a say in that, to be fair, so I'll just, I'll just go with the flow. Um, I think the manager's given us Christmas Day off this year as well, so... That's a, a bonus, but if the Christmas tunes come on, I'd rather be at training, I think. 
<laughs> Over to you, Anne. I think you're yeah, next on our list here. Obviously, Christmas time, lots of parties. What's your best party that you had at Spurs and uh, and your worst party that you had at Spurs? Who was like the organiser? Was was Keno up there all the time, yeah. Tom? <laughs> yeah, no, Keno was... He's a he good organiser. Um, yeah. I think, obviously, the the best one, which obviously a lot of people know, is when we, we went to Dublin. Um, we'd already had the Christmas party in Dublin. Obviously, like anywhere, there was about five or six teams over there, so there was a few yeah. pictures. Um, and then in a press conference, probably two weeks after, they decided to ask Harry if we was having a Christmas party. Um, which obviously the press knew about they were just like reeling him in kind of thing yeah um, and he was like oh no no Christmas party for the lads no one like none of the players have come and said to me am I allowing them to have one blah 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 and then obviously on the Saturday they decided to run the story that we'd had the Christmas party behind the manager's back and what have you but it wasn't meant like that but did you get a heads up is. Tom that was coming that story did you get a heads up yeah yeah We'd seen the press conference from the Friday right. uh, before a game and it they were making a big thing of him saying, oh no, we're not having a Christmas party. None of the lads have sort of mentioned it to me so we won't be having one. Obviously knowing full well that two weeks before that we was all out in Dublin partying. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the, the press just seemed like they, they were reeling him in. Um, which obviously it wasn't his fault. He took the bait kind of thing but yeah, weren't ideal. Can I ask you, Tom, on that point? Obviously, nowadays with social media, I mean, I feel like you guys can't even step out your front door yeah, with, sure. you know, the nature of it now. I mean, the things that you could, I say, get away with, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I mean, that must now, it can't be the same, can it? Can, can, you, can you arrange Christmas parties these days, you know, in, in, in the, you know where, where football is right now in football clubs? No, I don't think you can, to be honest, especially not even so much the bigger clubs, but I think just any Premier League club in general. Um, unless you're going to fly to the middle of nowhere in Europe, um, I think it's impossible. There's always people, camera phone, social media, trying to trip you up. Um, and you see nowadays when anything's happening, people's first thought is to get their phone out and start recording it, whether yeah. that's someone drunk in the street or even if people are in in pain and need medical help or something, yeah. people would rather film it than yep. get help. So I think nowadays, especially for the Premier League clubs and more so the bigger boys, I think Christmas parties are almost a thing of the past. It'll, have to, it'll probably turn into, I don't know, like a a meal with the families kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Meal Tom, with the, what, an, what an absolute horrible nonsense that is that, that we've come to that. Because if you like speak to any of the boys from Euro 96, Darren Anderton and Teddy Sheringham and Gaza, I mean, when they went out to Hong Kong, that absolutely Dennis found, it found that, that, that team together, like, you know, yeah. South Africa in 2010. Ledley King always says the only time we ever actually sort of binded together as a band of brothers was in the airport on the way home because we was allowed to have a beer and sort of, you know, relax a little bit. So what an absolute nonsense that, like, you know, the media contrives people to get the ump because a few players have gone out midweek when there's a game three days later. I mean, I'm you know, I'm 52. I can get over a beer, you know, for, for three, three days' time. So, so can a player. It's an absolute nonsense that these things happen now and players can't go out kick back and get together. You're going to bind together as a team far, far more if you're yep. going out and letting off a bit of steam rather than going, oh, can't go out tonight down to Charlie Chan's or 195 or wherever it is, you know, and go and have a few a, a few beers with the boys. That, that, that's perfect. That's exactly what makes a team. And shame on you if you're getting your camera phone out and going, oh, I'm going to go and sell this to the sun and the mirror and I'm going to go and get 50 quid for this. Like, go yeah. away. It's, it's nonsense. No, exactly. How, how much flack totally did Ledley good. get? How much flack did <laughs> Ledley get for leaving China Whites and ended up in a police cell for a week? <laughs> no, Ledley, Ledley's top man. Good on him. Uh, but 
he's not he's not the best at handling his alcohol um, as strong as his his physique and his size should do. Um, but yeah, I think I totally agree. It's one of them. There was times at Hull when we were having a bad run. Steve Bruce would. I remember one time he took us up to York Races um, on like a Tuesday afternoon or something, and we trained in the morning. Took us up to York Races, let us have a few drinks together, and just try and. When the lads have had a few drinks, they'll let their issues be known to each other as well, which can clear yeah. the air, and you start afresh on the Thursday kind of thing. Um, and it is. Nowadays, it's probably classed as an old school mentality to do that, but I think it can work both ways. If you're on a good run, you want to almost keep the momentum. And if that means going out as a group and enjoying each other's company away from the training ground, then so be it. But I think it's just as important as if you're in a bit of a, a sticky patch, um, bringing everyone together as well. Yeah, I think, I think we see yeah. that. I think we see that with a national team uh, this year in the Euros. You know, the way Gareth Southgate is, is uh, you know, maybe it's not going out and having a few beers or whatever, but the way that he's handled the media and bro- uh, enabled the media to almost come in rather than it us versus them type mentality that had been before and actually trying to bring them, them the, the you know, the players or like the band of brothers together. I think you've got more of a, a, an inclusive team there rather than kind of just individuals where you've been locked up in a hotel room for, you know, a week or two weeks during tournament football. I could never understand that. When you've been away on international duty in that time, have you like be, been locked away? It feels like, it. and I, I suppose most of the world now have felt that now because of COVID and, and the way that everything's gone from from our perspective. So maybe we can understand that a little bit more. But I could never understand why wouldn't you go out and have a few drinks or have a meal or be, be together, being locked up in your hotel room, and then then you hear stories in the media of people, um, you know playing PlayStation or you know Xbox or whatever it might be. Well, no wonder. What else is there to do? They're bored shitless, no. Yeah. Now, go back to what you mentioned with Ledley as well. I was in the sort of preliminary squad before the 2010 World Cup, and that was, as much as I was buzzing to be there and the chance of making the final 23, them two weeks training camp in Austria was a bit of a nightmare. You had, as you say, train back to the hotel. Because of the altitude in South Africa, we had this altitude box that we had to like a mask that we had to stick on for 30 minutes a day and other than that there was nothing else there was a little communal room with table tennis and a pool table but there's only so much of that you can do you're not going to stay there for 10 hours a day are you um it's just boring isn't it yeah it was hard work it was hard work under capello wasn't it by all accounts yeah i was only in a couple of squads um uh, and as I say, because I was relatively young, I was just happy to be there. But looking back now, yeah. it was hard work. And it, when I was in the under-21s, we had Peter Taylor as a manager. And that's when it used to be play on a Friday and a Tuesday. Um, and he would always take us out of the hotel on a Saturday, take everyone for a meal, uh, somewhere like obviously local to wherever the game was. Uh, but just for a change of scenery, a lot of the time, if we won on the Friday... He would give us a night out on the Saturday, obviously with quite an early curfew. Um, yeah, but yeah, that was some of the best trips you've ever been on, and was buzzing to get away. International breaks nowadays, everyone's like, oh, "I'd rather just stay at my yeah. club and train." But yeah, back then, it's so true. the twenty ones, it was yeah. exciting times to to get away and enjoy different company and scenery for a couple of weeks. I must ask you, Tom, quickly, Gunny, because Jace brought up Capello. Um, a fascinating podcast until quite a while ago, I think, with David Bentley on there, where they sneaked up a Mackie D's uh, to the hotel room just for Bentley because he just wanted to get something down him. It was that point where, you know, he just wasn't getting anything under Capello. <laughs> didn't, I think, again, very rigid in terms of the dietary requirements. They snicked, snacked up a Mackie D's. Was there anything happening like that in the, in the one-day Ramos camp at all on away days? Or not really? Um, I think there would have been. On the away days, I think the lads... Everyone seemed to bring slightly bigger bags um, once they banned everything. So I'm sure there's, I'm sure the lads had a few goodies, and that's what I mean. There's a fine balance because you ban butter and ketchup and stuff like that, but that may might result in the lads having, I don't know, a bag of Haribo's and a Snickers instead, which is a bit counterproductive, really. So I yeah. think it is a fine balance. Um, 
going back to Anthony's original question as well, I think my first Christmas do when I was at Derby as a 17-year-old kid, we basically went around the changing room. Everybody had to choose a fancy dress outfit that went into one pot <laughs> and in the other pot was your squad numbers. So we got the kit man <laughs> to choose one squad number and one thing. So it was quite pot look of what you got, but I got quite lucky and got incredible hook. So Oh, that's not too bad. Yeah, it that's put it a lot worse. Love that. <laughs> Well, I tell, I tell you what, what a, what a brilliant segue. You couldn't make this up. My next question to you, Tom, was fancy dress often seems to be the <laughs> footballer's choice. Um, so what have you got? As obviously you just told us to Hulk, what's been your best and worst costumes, for example, you've ever seen? And just before you before you answer that, best costume I've ever seen quickly is I, I went to Vegas for my stag do and it was uh, um, Halloween and somebody dressed up as um, Bumblebee. From <laughs> and it was it was like he was there. It was actually like Bumblebee was there in this club. It was unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. I couldn't believe my eyes. But yeah, what's your best and worst, Tom? Well, the Hulk was my first one. Um I had one of Robocop, which was quite good. It was like that's oh, decent. Right. That's decent. The pad, the pad chest. The one, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the helmet with just the the eyes thing. Um what else? Mr. Uh, Mr. Incredible, but I think, yeah, the I was a, a big fan of the Robocop one, I'd have to say. Um, Robocop, classic yeah. as well. That is a classic. Should, so should we go? Tottenham. Yeah, that was at Tottenham. I can't should remember we... what club it was at, but yeah. <laughs> Nice. Should we go around the room on that in terms of the, uh, the the costumes? I remember, I mean, I don't know, Tom, you ever went to this nightclub uh, in St Albans, uh, Batchwoods, and someone came. Yeah, I went uh, in Batchwoods. It better backwards. I went the uh, Kino. Kino once. Is it still there? Is it backwards still around? No, it's gone. Um, all these clubs now. I feel so old. Every time I was like, oh, that one's gone. That one's gone. Oh, okay, that one's gone. Um, I remember someone coming with the uh, with the saw mask. I remember just people were running away. He had the he had he actually had the actual thing with him as well, drilling. Suddenly, this scene of people running towards you. I've never seen so many women running to me so fast. This is amazing. Keep them coming. <laughs> this is fantastic. I'm absolutely loving this. Uh, but honestly, that that was uh, quite incredible. Any anyone else got any uh, fancy dress costumes they've come across or worn at all they want to bring to the table? A lot, I a lot remember of in, I remember in Benidorm about five or six years ago, and we used to go out at about 10 p.m. at night because nothing really got started until about 10 p.m. And uh, getting a taxi down to the square, get and uh, jumped out uh, at the edge of the square, and there was this geezer from up north, and he was absolutely stark naked, not a thing on, laying <laughs> on the floor, uh, and he was he was handcuffed to two midgets, and and that was his stag do, and his mates had left him. He was there with about sixty mates apparently. Everyone had left him. And he was just in the middle of the square in Benidorm, stark bollock naked and handcuffed to two midgets. And he was just out cold. And honestly, Benidorm in summer is just he's just off the scale. You'd see like 12 foot tall dinosaurs trying to get into bars. It was just just nuts, absolutely nuts. But that, that's my one abiding memory was this naked geezer just, just handcuffed to two midgets. And just done, completely done, right out of it. Love it. Okay, Rich, we stick with you. Uh, I think you've got a question for Tom. (coughs) Yes, Tom, uh, not a big fan of Christmas, but do you have any traditions as a family or yourself at Christmas uh, time and any that you really love or anything that you really hate around Christmas? Personally, as soon as Mariah Carey comes on the radio, that's it. It's off, gone. See you later. I can't. I can't be listening to her whining and and singing. But any, any family, any family traditions? Lee, that, Lee, that Lee looked good singing it the other night, though, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I put a good voice on that, Chase. To be honest. <laughs> um, no, there's not really. Obviously, a, a film, a couple of films together, but there's nothing like bang on tradition that has to stay every year, to be honest. Um, as I said, with some managers, we've had to train and travel Christmas Day. Mm. Uh, others have given us a day off. So it does, a lot depends and revolves around the football, really. Um, 
so yeah, unfortunately, there's nothing that I can say um, that's a regular tradition, to be honest. Tom, promise me that when you retire, your first Christmas after retirement, when you do finally hang up the boots, please pull the ripcord. Absolutely pull the ripcord <laughs> and just go bananas on Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, <laughs> and have a right good blowout, because I can thoroughly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, no, I've heard, I've heard very good things about the night outs on Christmas Eve. I've uh, just never been a part of one yet, so... <laughs> No, 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 what did you do last year, though? If you were if you were at the game for that year, what was what was Christmas like last year? Um, no, that it was all right. Obviously, we locked down, weren't we? Co- yeah, COVID it was bits and bobs, of course. Yeah, lockdown. Yeah, yes, right. yeah. 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 Right, um, we are going to go for um, our final break of the show for our listeners that are on audio. Um, for our watching audience on YouTube, thank you as always for joining us on this special Last One on Spurs Christmas show. Now, um, we are doing a Christmas presents exchange. I want to give a shout out to Jason McGovern, who very kindly uh, wrote up the script for us this evening. So um, just to make that point, Jason wrote up this script. All the questions you've heard are Jason. So any feedback you've got, feel free to send it to the McGovern mailbox and we'll read those out ahead of our future upcoming shows where Jason and might find himself back on the Europa Conference League panel, depending on the verdict, if we get put back into it, which uh, he can't wait to happen. We're out of it. We're out of it. <laughs> never say never. Tom, Tom, would, Tom, would you want to play in the Europa Conference League? Be honest. <laughs> um, not particularly, but I f- again, I think that would have been a, a good chance of a trophy, albeit not a really historic one, but it would have been a a realistic chance of a trophy. Uh, I don't actually know the ins and outs of that competition either. Does that qualify you for the Champions League? Yeah, you qualify for the Eurovision Song Contest, mate. That's what happens. (laughs) (laughs) Tom, Tom, let's be honest. It's the competition Uh, where the dog runs on the pitch and has a shit (laughs) and players draw numbers (laughs) on each other's backs. Oh, that's that's so, so let's, be, let's be honest, Tom. We wouldn't have got any credibility for winning that. If we would have actually, if, if you're being totally honest, we would have been laughed yeah, at, true. and we, it would have been a meme on on the internet if we're being totally honest. Yeah, I think I think the best scenario for the club, as you say, is be out of it, concentrate. That fourth spot is up for grabs now. Everybody assumed Man United would take that and run away with it, but now that's fully up for grabs. Um, and as much as trophies are important, as you said, rather than winning that and being a meme, fourth place is is what a club the size of Tottenham, the facilities, the squad, the manager, uh, that's what that's what they're craving. So I think if you can have full focus on the league, and I'm surprised the club are actually appealing it, to be honest, because uh, I'm sure mm. Antonio will be thinking, sort of, thank God we're out of that because I can... I can have a more structured plan week to week, playing, okay. not playing catch up because I've got to play on a Sunday. Um, my games can still be on a Saturday and sort of stay in contact or sort of put the first shot in over the weekends if you've got an early game on a Saturday and other teams are playing on a Sunday. Yeah, Tom, I can't they quite John, believe you don't want John. to play against Legia Trousers or Dynamo Tiki Girl <laughs> in a conference league. It's, it's incredible. We've we've got John Wenham on the appeals case. Don't worry, we're, we're definitely not playing in the rest of Europe. <laughs> Don't worry, John sorted it. John, can you confirm? Can you ratify that, John? Can you verify that for us? The paperwork is in, and we'll find out shortly. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I've got um, my flight book for the final, so I hope it does go ahead. Chris, I tell you what, any fine, no matter he's there, he's there. Like I say, the trophies have to be coming. Right, um, so this is what we've got here first. We have got a presence exchange, but before that, as Jason's very kindly put in our script over here, uh, have we got any favourite Christmas memories? Maybe a great game, maybe a great Tottenham present, and just how many Christmases have Tottenham ruined? Now, um, you know what, really, I think me, only growing, my, me growing up, Spurs haven't normally done too bad over the festive period, I feel. We've not had a no. horrific think, period. That, boys, any, any want to come in here? No, I think one of my 97, 98. 97, 98. Yes. When Jürgen came back to rescue us, we got mm. battered away at Villa 4 1, Christmas 97. And we were, yes. we were in the bottom three then. And we, things were looking bleak. And as a teenager, I was obviously getting ripped at school. 
Um, and uh, it looked like Spurs were going down. It really did. That was the worst one. It's the only Christmas I actually thought they might go down there. Was you there, Jase? It was horrible, mate. Colin Calderwood scored with an hand ball. I think Colin, yeah, Colin Moore got a couple. VAR? Was VAR not around then, Jase? No, oh, no. It definitely been disallowed. I remember, I remember we were sitting in the... Because we had season, uh, we had a friend who had tickets as a season ticket holder at Villa. They had family up in Birmingham. And when he scored, my old man stood up and said, it's a hand ball. And I looked at him and said, so, so boo, 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 what? I mean, just celebrate the goal. But the, the Villa people around were, were fuming at it. But uh, you're right. I think it was Collymore, I think, dumped us that day. I can I can remember, Crackers will know that one, when, um, funnily enough, we, we battered the batterers, didn't we, on a, on a boxing day, beating 4-0 with a Stevie Hodge, signed Stevie Hodge, and he made his debut with, with Clive, and, Clive and Paul Allen scoring against them. So, yes. And then a yeah. couple of weeks later, we beat West Ham 5-0. So, uh, you know, to That's do a 4-0 right. and 5-0 in the space of a couple of weeks, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I think one of my oh, favourites was, I think we played Fulham at Atlanta. I think Tom was playing as well. We beat him 4-0, I think. We just, we uh, absolutely destroyed him. Was it 4-0, Tom? I thought it was, I was thinking about it. I thought it was 5-1. Even 5-1. I don't That's know, even better. That sounds better, Geese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I remember going, I remember going, I'm thinking Fulham... Not so much a bogey team, but they'll always turn up against us and blah, blah, blah. You know, the usual pessimistic Spurs fan that I am. But Berber and I think... Did you score, Tom? Or did Berber score two? If it's a game I'm thinking, I scored two. And I probably should have had an at-trick, but I decided to pass yes. to Defoe in a six-yard box and he scored a tackle. Yes, 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 that's, that's it. it. Great game that was, man. That was quality. Yeah, yeah, five one. Then. Yeah, I'll take that one. That's one I always think back to. 2010, I think. Uh, up at Villa Park, Van der Vaart double. Watching yeah. the whole family. Oh, Unbelievable. Yeah. Even better, Robert Pires was playing Villa at the time. And he was trying to give it the big one to our coaching staff. He got subbed off, remember? And a few yeah. people in front of him on the side. So that made my Christmas seeing Pires put in his place. Always hated him. Uh, happy day. <laughs> Actually, I Tom, that, um, that word Spursy, what do the what do the players make of that? Do they do they do they take that word in, or do they just think, oh god, all right, just knock it on the head? But or is it a, a, a conscious word that even they they uh, they think about? I think when I was there, I don't really think it was so much of as a word then, um, but it it does wind me up and frustrate me nowadays. To be honest, the way people still use it. Um, yep. As I mentioned, when I was at Tottenham, especially the beginning part, you had the top four were set in stone, weren't they? You had Man United, Liverpool, Arsenal, Chelsea. Um, that between the four of them, maybe not so much Arsenal, but the other three were reaching semi-finals and finals of the Champions League regular um, and spending the most. So it was always going to be a case of they were going to be there or thereabouts and winning all the domestic trophies. Uh, obviously, Man City have come along since, spent a few quid. Um, so as much as people say Spursy, you look at teams a few years ago that were maybe on par with with Tottenham, your Everton's, your Aston Villas, that they've not won anything either in a long time. So yeah. um, it is frustrating. Um, but again, that's another one of them things where you think just get one get one trophy, get it done and dusted, um, and then let everybody think of a different word to to try and use for the next couple of I years. I keep saying this this run, if we could do this League Cup this year, to do West Ham in a quarter, Chelsea in a semi, and beat Arsenal ideally in a final, it yeah. would just take so much. And all that, all that hurt we felt and all the banter we've had to put up with, what a glorious way to... to to actually get over that, I mean, you you did you did uh, Arsenal win a semi and Chelsea in a final, yeah. which just I think it'll be fantastic for the club. And then because it's in a February final, to then just really push with the with a the belief then for the rest of that season be brilliant for us. And no Europe now as well. And that, that, yeah, that, uh, off the back of that, I think that's that's really really big. I I, I totally agree. And I, like you look at you look at some of these. Uh, 
the situations what like you to talk about there, Tom, about you know spending a few quid and the top four was set in stone. Then Man City come onto the scene, and then obviously they started blowing everyone away with the money spent. Just interested to hear your view, Tom, on Newcastle because they they, they look like that they are dropping like a stone right now, and they might not. They're yeah. going to have a January transfer window. They've got all the money apparently in the world, but they might go down. It's a very very bizarre situation. Do you think that you know over? Kind of probably the next three, four, five years or so, we're going to see another huge, huge push from from the likes of Newcastle to get into that kind of top echelon of the Premier League. Yeah, I think I think we will for sure. Obviously, looking at the way Man City did it, it, what it, it probably took them four or five years to really establish themselves as title challengers. Um, the first time we finished fourth, obviously they were spending a lot of money then, but we managed to just sort of pick them to fourth place. Um, so, yeah, with Newcastle, they need to make sure they stay up this year. Otherwise, it seems it's going to be a long, a long route back. Because if imagine a club the size of Newcastle with all that financial backing in the championship, it's going to be every team's cup final every week. Yeah. So, every day, as much as they'll be big favourites, it, it won't be easy because the championships are tough demanding league um, but I think if they do stay up they've got the fan base they've got the infrastructure um, obviously they've definitely got the owners with a, the money to spend um, but first and foremost they need to stay up um, and I think it will be a case maybe in a, a similar time scale to Man City over four or five years where Newcastle are probably knocking on the door for the definitely the top six Top four might be a push because you need a lot of boxes ticked to get that. You need the right team, the system, the scouting, um, director of football working on the same lines as the manager. So there is a lot more that goes into it rather than just throwing money at it, as we've seen with the likes of Fulham over the past few years when they got promoted, throwing a lot of money at it, but doesn't necessarily guarantee success. Yeah. Well, can I ask a quick question, mate? Quickly. Um, who's the most gifted footballer you've seen at Spurs in your time? I mean, you see the likes of like Del Tarrat. I mean, he had the, he had the ability, and obviously, he went, no. I know you. I know everyone laughs, but he. No, I was just about to say him. That's why I'm laughing. I was you about to sorry, Giza. I'll let you say think, that because no. So when I when people ask me the best player I played with and stuff, I always. Obviously, for me, I'd say Berbatov, Modric and Bale are my three. But I think yeah. for the whole time that I played with him, I always say Berbatov was number one because he came in yeah. and was brilliant. And obviously, when yeah. he left, he, he went to Man United. Um, but I think for the natural ability, I think there's not many players that I've ever played with or seen that have had more natural ability than what Adele had. Um, wow. As, you, as we mentioned earlier, with foreign players adapting, I listened to a podcast he was on the other week with one of my friends, Nader Manua. Yep. And he, sort of, he said he found it difficult because he moved over when he was 17, obviously away from all his family and friends, his second language. Um, so if people look at that away from football, imagine a normal 17-year-old having to move country away from their family and yeah. friends. It is it is difficult to think of. Um, but yeah, I think for natural ability, he's definitely one of the best I've seen. Um, and to be fair to him, he's, he's got his career back on track. He's, he's right. tweaked his position. He's playing is, as a... Is he at Benfica? Is he at Benfica? Yeah, he's at Benfica, Benfica playing as like a, a number six nowadays. So... I'm sure a lot of players that have played with him would have never imagined him playing as a deeper midfielder. Um, but yeah, he's got his career back on track. He's been at Benfica for the past few years, so I'm pleased for him. Let's come to Jamie. Jay, over to you. I know you had a question there for Tom. Yeah, just what, just a quick one. Um, it's, a, it's a debate that we always have as fans um, in terms of a top, a top four and a trophy. As a player, kind of what what would you see as more important, getting in the top four or winning a trophy like the FA Cup or the Carabao Cup? What what do you think is more important? Um, I'm not sure to be honest. You know, I think my time at Tottenham, we were desperate to 
broke the mould of the top four. And yep. Thankfully, we was, we was able to do it. Um, whether that's because we had won the League Cup a couple of years before, and that was our main focus then. Um, but I think nowadays, I don't think the League Cup holds as much significance as the FA Cup. So I would say the FA Cup and fourth, and then probably the League Cup. But I think the situation Tottenham are in, with it having been 13, 14 years sort of since we won that uh, League Cup, I think any trophy now would be would be the, the most important thing to shut a lot of people up. Um, and as you, as you said earlier, with the League Cup being in February, it gives you the next sort of three months to fully focus focus on the league. And if you win the League Cup and finish fourth, and although there's been a change of manager, it has been a positive season all round, really. Tom, can I just ask a quick question about social media? I just wondered, do you know many players that actually look at social media? If they've had a bad game, um, you know, do they look at social media such as Twitter and do they watch channels like this to, 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 to want to know what the fans really think about them? Um, I'm not sure I'm watching channels like this, to be honest, uh, but I know a lot of the lads um, do go on social media and even some more high-profile players that I've played with, that I won't mention them for now, but you see them on the coach sometimes. If they've had a good or bad game, you'll see them on the Twitter handle, um, searching their name and looking at all thousands That's of fascinating. comments. Really? That, that is, is fa yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. They, have, that's they, have a, they have an alias account and then they'll go on and have a, have a bit of a barney with a fan or something under a different name. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, well, I've, seen that the, I've seen basketball, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I know a lot of the players, I don't know, say the club post something, a lot of the lads will look at all the comments underneath, but yeah, there's definitely been a few that will, will search their names in the, the search bar and have a look through all the comments, which is a dang dangerous thing to do, I would say. Uh, yeah. Even if yeah. you think you've had a good game, there's going to be a, a decent percentage that have got something negative to say so it's probably not worth it and I think you probably get that with age and experience you realise if if you've had a good game or as long as you, the manager and the coaching staff are sort of happy with how you perform then a lot of the other opinions don't really matter too much and it, it's not wor worth working yourself up for reading hundreds of different comments because everyone's got their own comment uh, sorry their own opinion on exactly the same thing so football is all just about opinions um, so there's only a few that really matter and also modern day social media in my opinion is more toxic than it's ever been you get individuals setting up accounts just to troll people so personally, yeah. if I was a professional footballer, I wouldn't go near it. Uh, the comments, anyway, no, no point. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, I think you have to be mentally fairly tough and be willing to accept any criticism if you are going to do that. Um, which again is why I say people probably learn with experience and age. Um, don't get yourself wound up over other people's opinion. Um, if you think you've played well and other people don't, whereas on the other hand, you, you might think you've had, had a bit of a shocker, but other people are telling you you've played well. So you've got to take everything on social media for a big pinch of salt, I'd say. Absolutely. Now, Tom, it's um, been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Um, we just uh, say from us, um, just want to say, uh, for me personally, just what a pleasure it's been to have you on for this Christmas special. Um, I think from all of us, we can safely say that you've been a real favourite of our time during the club. And, you know, hopefully one day we look forward to welcoming you back and some capacity at Tottenham, which I think would be great to see. I'm sure the boys, you probably echo those thoughts as well, right? Yeah, 100%. Absolutely fantastic. And, uh, yeah, we'd love to see you back at the club, and, you know, coaching, uh, bringing, it, bringing your experiences back into the, into the youngsters. Um, or, or, or just being down there, you know, as an ambassador, like what Dawes is doing, you know, I think it'd be yeah. absolutely phenomenal. But like Cracker said earlier, you know, you, you and you said it yourself, you've still got loads to offer the game. So don't don't hang your boots up too quick. 
No, thank There's you. not too many who hit a ball as sweet as you, mate, that's for sure. So, no, um, te- technic- oh, technically, technically ridiculous. Ridiculous. Cheers. In a good way, Tom. A goal at City. Was a no. goal at City your best one? Um... That's a nice question that, to end it on for Tom. Oh, yeah, Tom, what, what is, what's your favourite Spurs goal? That's a nice way to win that for Tom. It's tricky because it, it, I've got three that mean a lot to me. Um, obviously, the City one was my first Premier League goal. Um, right, OK. It's it. That was amazing. Uh, the Bolton one that we mentioned was quite key in us winning that game 1-0 and then on the Wednesday beating City to finish in the top four. If we didn't beat Bolton, it would have left it in Man City's hands either way. Um, so, yeah, probably between the two of them, to be honest. Yeah. I love it. Well, fantastic. Tom, on behalf of us all, thank you so much for joining have us. Have a great Christmas, Tom. And Thanks Tom, you. Cheers, Tom. Tom. Say, Thanks, we Tom. look forward to seeing you back on the pitch very soon. Appreciate it, Thanks, Tom. Tom. Happy Christmas, Thanks, mate. Tom, cheers, Tom, mate. Happy Christmas. Tom. Back on the season as well, Tom. Cheers. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Mate. Right, guys. Tommy honestly, Huddleston. Tommy yeah. Huddleston. Tommy, 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 Tommy Huddleston. Oh, that legend, that is. Great, Tommy legend. Huddleston. Do you know right, what, guys. Rick? Rick, oh. he's, a to- he's Tom Brady Huddleston, wasn't he? Because if he was a quarterback in American football, like he could ping a ball. And like honestly, I'm like Jace, I've been going there since the mid-70s. And I don't think I ever saw any player put a ball on a sixpence like uh, like Tommy could since Glenn, and that's that's probably the biggest like compliment, uh, compliment that I can yeah. that I can pay him. He just he's phenomenal, just that phenomenal touch, just to be able to put it in that crack. He had that half, half folly as well, didn't he? That yeah, he was piece. just yeah, it was a, a sublime touch, you know. And uh, I always said if he played America, if he played gridiron football, American football, he'd have been an absolute legend. He had just had this. Wonderful, wonderful touch to him. Could absolutely put you on a sixpence. Brilliant. You're a really nice guy as well. Yeah, lovely guy. Lovely, lovely, lovely guy. Now, uh, guys, um, there's been, let's say, from Jason here, a uh, a series of presents exchanging virtually, which we must do. Um, who will remain anonymous? Someone actually asked me, "Are we actually going to buy these presents?" And my response to him was, "Not a nothing chance." Uh, so these are virtual, just to confirm. Although I do know some actually had a present delivered to them personally. Um, so what we will do, like I say, is um, we'll start as the means of our script. There you go. Merry Christmas, the, uh, Jay. <laughs> Twelve ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to start with a. Uh, John, because uh, John is buying for crackers, I'm led to believe. So we'll start <laughs> as we mean to go on. Oy vey. Oy now, this vey. one was, was a, a nice, easy one. I've got to know crackers really well over the last year and a half on these pods. And if one person sprung to mind, I was going to deliver crackers a proper present. It would be an intimate evening with Miss Nigella Lawson. And within Aye. this evening, within this evening, it would be her delivering a world-class shepherd's pie. She would teach him through the recipe. We know he loves a shepherd's pie or likes talking about shepherd's pies. And she would deliver that and it would be Crackers' dream to open up Nigella Lawson and a shepherd's pie. So that would be my first gift for Mr. Richard Crackle. My second oh, gift... Man. Now, I need a bit oh, of money man. This, but my second gift would be to get Mr. Cracknell a residency back in N17, moving back over to Tottenham because he is Tottenham royalty. There's not anybody down Tottenham that doesn't know Rich. Young or old, he could walk into any pub. Everyone would know him, stop and have a chat with him, have a drink with him. And that's testament to you, mate. Everyone loves you at Tottenham. And uh, I would just love to get you back there permanently. So we need you back, Spain. You need to move back over. And uh, we need you back in Tottenham, mate, because you are part of the furniture. Tottenham royalty, my friend. Merry Christmas. Oh, uh, uh, lovely. Uh, Merry yeah. Christmas to you, John. But you know what? I feel like uh, Ray Winston in Sexy Beast. I, I'm, I'm not coming back, not even for one last job. That, uh, <laughs> I, I like to I like to dip in. I like to come back, do some nights, let off a bit of steam in London and around the country, and then come back home because like, Lanzarote and the Canary Islands feels like home. But very, very humble, John. That's 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 really lovely, and uh, it's a family show. So I'm going to park the Nigella Lawson uh, comments right there and 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 say no more. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. That's that's a wonderful gift. I opened that up. I'd be I'd be chuffed. 
Well, your smile said it all, Crackers. <laughs> you, you, you'd love to open it up, Crackers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> get out. Oh, he had to go get there, out. didn't he? There'll he be no dismissing of a... <laughs> Willy right. nilly. That's it. Thank you. We're going to hand over uh, next. Oh, no, hold on. Well, we've done the last bit. Sorry, John. You've I've got, got two more us, parts um, here, mate. You've got two more parts, mate. Go for it. Sorry. Carry on. Please do. Miss, Mr. Arteta, what would I get him? A bloody personality would be a start. I tell you, I find him <laughs> dull as a dishwasher. I'd also like to whack him with a 40-point deduction. That would be my present for Mr. Arteta. I tell you, a nice 40-point deduction. Get that mob liquidated. Final one. Present for a player. Now... I've been given Mr. Davidson Sanchez. And Mr. Davidson Sanchez, unfortunately, seems to suffer from a bit of vertigo. So I would get him tickets up the Eiffel Tower. Let's get him used to being up high, watching things. You know, he's got a real phobia of heights, in my opinion. And, and when anything comes over the top, he's struggling. So we've managed to spend 42 million quid on a bloke with vertigo. So trip up the Eiffel Tower. Let's get his balancing on point. Um, and a present from Sanchez to me would be a refund of the 85 quid. 85 quid. <laughs> I spent on that after his debut at Goodison. I was I thought this guy was going to be the next Marcel Desailly and he'd be off to Real Madrid two years later. Instead, 85 quid. So you owe me, Mr. Sanchez. I've always wondered who buys those defender shirts apart from Ledley. You've just shown me why. Mate, I've got a Dawson one upstairs as well. I love a good old centre-half shirt. I love it. Fantastic. Next, we're handing over to, uh, to Chris. Chris, over to you, mate. Well, I've got to buy for you, Ricky. And I tell you what, ever since I've met you, you've constantly got your phone in your hand and you're constantly busy. Um, you know, if you if if we if one of us sends you a message and you haven't replied within five minutes, we know it's been ignored because we know that that phone is constantly in your hand. So I am buying you a two week holiday to a desert island just with you, your wife and your little boy. So you can Aww. spend some quality time with your family. Uh, no internet access whatsoever, no transfer gossip, no transfer news, no no podcast, no booking guests, nothing like that. Just relax. And that is what you need to do. So have a nice time. Thank um, you, mate. The manager that I've got to buy for is Eddie Howe. Um, I would buy him uh, some quality players from Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. I'd buy him Matt Doherty and I'd buy him Giovanni Lo Celso because they haven't done anything for us. So perhaps they'll do something for him. Um, the player that I've got to buy for is Pierre-Emil Hoybier. Um, I know I can't buy a trophy. I'd love to buy a trophy, but we can't do that. Um, I'd buy him Bruno Fernandes in our centre midfield and actually get you know something moving and, and, and get a bit of creativity in there. I love it. Fantastic. Right, we're going to move on. We've got Frankie next. Uh, Frankie, over to you, mate. Well, you gave me the easiest one because you gave me Ant. And obviously, we all know what Ant would love more than anything else. And that is, to begin with, a signed Harry Winks shirt. Uh, and, a meet and, greet, and, and a meet and greet, a day with Harry Winks. So you meet him at the training ground. You, you go into the training ground with him. You watch highlight reels of, of you know, his Tottenham career. Best uh, bits. Questions Best bits. About, about why, you know, he's one of your favourite players and so on. So that, for me, would be Ant's present. Um, I've got... As managers, I've got Ralph Ragnick, which I thought was quite hard because obviously he's a bit of an unknown quantity in, in English football. But I did see this week he was questioning the the point and, and the actual reason behind why we are one of the only leagues or, or divisions or, or uh, countries in world football that actually have two domestic cups. So I would buy Ralph uh, to sit next to me a ticket to the semi-final to watch Tottenham Chelsea because that will be the only semi-final that he'll be watching this season at Manchester United, believe you me. So, um, sour grapes. I don't know why all these managers come over here and question traditions and cups and so on, but we, we like the League Cup. We like the FA Cup. It's been going for longer than you, Ralph. Um, and the player I got, which I was hoping would go to Jason, was Tongi and Lombele, because obviously we all know it's Jason's favourite player. Oh, now, the first thing I would buy him, if you could physically bottle it and give it to him, would be a brand new attitude. Uh, but obviously, we can't get him one of those. So it would be six personal training sessions with none other than Mr. Motivator, the old legend from ITV, because that way you could get him in shape, possibly to last beyond 55 to 60 minutes and give the man a bit of motivation because that's what he needs more than anything. So I've, those are the Christmas presents. I was, I was hoping I'd get him, Frank, because then I could just say I'm not asked to buy anything. 
Well, that's, listen, again, the, the one thing that I would get the man would be a new attitude because I, I truly believe if he had the right attitude, yeah. we might be able to see a proper player there, but who knows? I love it. Right, we're going to hand over now to Jamie over to Danny Oxford. Jay, over to you. Okay, uh, yes. So, Frank, unfortunately, I was buying for you and unfortunately, I've decided to go for something maybe that you might not like, but it's, it's just to kind of wind up all the other locks. I know they're a massive fan of him. We did just have the discussion uh, on the WhatsApp earlier. I think Adama Traore is going to be coming in January. So I'm going to buy you an Adama Traore shirt for when he is the league's best right wing back. Um, so, yeah, I, I, that's just to kind of wind up the other guys. So, uh, as you can see, that, that's Jason's reaction. So, love yeah. it, love it, love it, man. <laughs> I, I think it'd be a brilliant side of for us. It's going to be the best right wing back in the league. Just, so. just for Tony Rogers, uh, yeah. Jamie, do you want to show me what's on this shirt? Yeah, Give it so, in the Zoom yeah, there yeah, for Jason. It does Jason. look a bit weird if you weren't there at the start. It's, uh, it's Danny Rose in a Christmas hat. Uh, so another one of Jason's favourites. So um, I was trying to Covering find all bases. one. So yeah, that's who's on my shirt. Um, who else did I get? I got, so the manager was Rafa Benitez. So I think that was fairly obvious. A half and half scarf for the Merseyside derby. <laughs> Liverpool. <laughs> and everything. I think that was a fairly obvious gift. Um, and for Eric Dyer, a bit of a weird one. But I've gone for a packet of Imodium so that he doesn't so he doesn't have to go to the toilet during a match again. Because uh, obviously at the moment we definitely need him. So uh, yeah, that's what I've got Eric for Christmas. So Merry Christmas, Eric. Ricky, it. Ricky, nothing says uh, nothing says last word on Spurs more than Jason McGovern with a face like a bulldog licking piss off of a nettle. Does it when somebody <laughs> when somebody mentions a player that he doesn't like? <laughs> I would just, I mean, I know it's difficult. We can't have a WhatsApp group with, you know, thousands in it. But um, every time uh, Adama, sure his name has come up so far in that WhatsApp group, I just know Jason's like this. No, just, it's, Jason, know. it's Jason when he does that. Yeah, yeah it's that. It's that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we've had a stranger players at the club, Jason. They've come and well, they've worked out. So, you know, you never know. Um, I got John. And this is obviously for me, obviously I've known John for quite a while now. I know obviously John's dedication, I must say, to uh, the youth of Tottenham is beyond any question. This guy uh, lives and breathes the youth. He's got a tremendous podcast, um, Lee White underscore Rose, in terms of the Twitter account. But if you haven't listened to the Lee White Rose podcast, please go and check it out. Um, what I would love to do is buy John, and I know he goes to the training ground anyway here, but I'd love to buy him a week at that training ground with those players just so they would be able to see the enthusiasm and passion he has for our young academy boys. Because honestly, it's uh, something to really you know behold. The uh, the man that speaks with so much joy about what is coming through at Tottenham. And I think it's so important because in that first start of the, se- well, the, the first period of the season where we were so disenfranchised under Nuno, I know many people, John, use that pod um, as almost a therapy. And they still are using that because they wanted to hear about the players coming through. So again, um, if you have not you know, tuning into that podcast, please go and do so. There's some quality content on there. It's not a last word on Spurs, two hours edition, which Jason is still trying to understand and he's currently still stuck in August. Um, but generally, like I say, it's a short, snappy podcast that um, does go down really, really well. Uh, Jason, do you want to come in there? I, I could see the look. The look was enough. Well, I mean, last night we started one day and finished the next... I mean, stu- I mean, how long does yeah. a game of football last? I know this is the problem. We're doing we're doing double sessions though as well. You know, Conte be proud. Um, but that's just on the on the um, on the on for John. That's the present uh, for me. I got Jurgen Klopp. Obviously, on the back of what we saw last week, or probably bought him a, a pair of specs. Um, anything else would have been probably a muzzle. The way that bloke's going at the moment, he's just an absolute <laughs> nightmare to be honest here. Um, can't stand him. Never liked him and uh, don't want him anywhere near my football club. Obviously, depending on where this goes with Conte, I won't come back and say this in six months' time. If it does go all wrong, if it does go all wrong, I will be asking for Conte to top two come in if it does go all wrong and Gerard goes and manages Liverpool. But we'll leave that there. Uh, finally, Harry Winks. Um, right, what would I buy Harry Winks? I thought what I would do is I'd want to send Winksy away for a week, a week with Roy King and just toughen him up mentally. Now, obviously, that Amazon documentary, anyone saw it, Um Ant's face there is going to tell the story of what I'm going to say here. Um, Winks' reaction... Not, not, not a blue ticket, Rick. Not a blue <laughs> ticket. <laughs> and a blue... OK, it's and a blue ticket. VIP. Winks' reaction, right, when he came on that documentary, when the uh, the flashing was of Mourinho, the highlights of Mourinho's... I don't know if you remember it's in the Amazon documentary. They, had, they played the Mourinho almost highlight travel, all these trophies uh, being shown on the screen behind them as he was going to walk in. And uh, Winks, he turned around to the rest of the boys and said, do you think training's going to be different at all? 
I just thought, geez, what's wrong with this kid? So I would give him a week away with Roy Keane, let him toughen him up. And um, yeah, listen, I've got to say, Winksy, just to be honest about it, in the last few weeks, there has been a gradual improvement there. And um, I think he'll be at the club beyond January. So uh, interesting um, <laughs> to see, like I say, the reaction of some of our members. <laughs> Merry Christmas, then. Merry Christmas. And on that note, I'll hand over... And on that note, I'll hand over to uh, Jason McGovern. <laughs> well, I had to buy for, for young Jamie, who's who's already hiding, look, which is a bit of a way. I've already treated him to a Papa John's pizza and a Happy Meal toy. So um, I've, I've sent him Michelangelo round to Jamie's house. He's going to paint that bedroom ceiling with a lovely life-size picture of Fabrizio Romano. And Jamie can go to bed and gaze every night and talk to talk to Fabrizio and feel all the, you know, Fabrizio in his classic here-we-go mode. And Jamie will be, well, I don't want to do Jamie's laundry for the next few weeks when he's seen that picture, that's for sure. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm, I got Pep Guardiola, and I'm buying Pep a voodoo doll of Daniel Levy complete with a nodding head so that uh, Pep can practice a bit more negotiation skills on how to get a, a proper offer accepted for, for Harry. But I think he's going to have to go for Erland. And then I'm, I was tasked with Sergio Reggion and I'm, I'm taking January and I'm going to treat Sergio to a romantic weekend away. But the key thing is it will be whilst he's playing. So only his Mrs. Martha Diaz can go. And I'm sending Jamie down to Marta Diaz because I know he has, a, he has a bit of a fetish for Marta Diaz, does our Jamie. And I want to see if a weekend with Marta Diaz can stop Jamie looking at transfer news. I think I just, just want to see that. I love it. Uh, and over to you, mate. I'm, I've got Lee. I love him. I love Lee. Love his enthusiasm. He's the crazy train man. So there's only one thing real... I could buy, Lee. And that is a and that is a uh, weekend away with his missus on the Orient Express. He's going on that train on the Orient Express around Europe, um, stopping off. Going to come see me and the boys in the con in, at, in a concert, um, and then yeah, and then uh, that, that's my present to you, Lee, mate. Love um, it, mate. Love it. For Thomas Tuchel, this was a tough one because he hasn't really got. I, I, you know, I get Thomas Tuchel. I get him a. A couple of days at the comedy club, just to give him a bit of him, a bit of a personality, because he comes across a bit like not dull, but yeah, yeah. It's got something in he that you think, okay, I can see where you're going with this. You know, you've got a bit of bit of banter, but give him a couple of days on the uh, comedy circuit. And my um, my player is uh, is the one and only Christian Romero, and he's just had a baby, so the baby's going to get a nice baby grow, nice Tottenham baby grow with love it. With with Romero on the back, mate. That's that's well, that, well, well, that, well, that done so slick by Anne. Well, that done so sick. Oh, honestly, man, love tell it, you mate. what, love it. What a present! Oh, I'm looking honestly. forward to it. You're an express, Lee. You know, it's beautiful, that. mate. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Mr. Cracknell, it's your time. Uh, thank you very much, Ricky. So first up, I'm going to go with the uh, player. Um, that I'd buy a present for. And that was Lucas Mora. I was tasked with buying a present for Lucas Mora. And I thought maybe, you know, Brazilian. Um, and we all know what else is uh, Brazilian. So I was going to get him a, a picture of Dan Daniel Levy. But I decided not to do that. I'll, I'll leave you to work the rest of that joke out for yourself. Um <laughs> So I was going to buy him. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to... Chris has got it. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm going to buy him the seven-inch single of David Bowie's Starman because there's a great song about Lucas Mora, okay, which hasn't quite taken off. It's been around the pubs a little bit, but I'm sure it's going to make its way onto the terraces one day. <clears throat> so I'll buy him a seven-inch single of David Bowie's Starman. There's a Starman playing on the ride. His name is Lucas Mora, and he's fucking dynamite. So, so I'll, I'll give him that on vinyl as, as a little present. Um, secondly, uh, I was tasked with buying a, a Christmas present for Chris Carlin, and uh, I probably went outside of the Matrix here and uh, took the red pill and actually bought this for Chris Carlin. So over to you, Chris. What did I get you? 
Crackers bought me a lovely book called The Extra Mile, and it's about um, well, I'll show you. It's uh, it's got lots of different places. Rather than going on the motorways for away games, it's got lots of different places where I can visit. So it's Look a very, that. very thoughtful present, a lovely present, and I definitely will use it. So thank you so much. Amazing. Brilliant. Look at that. Listen, ladies and gents, Chris Carlin, home and away, every yep. game. He's up Absolutely. and down those motorways. He's yep. on Ryanair planes, landing like Even the check of trade. miles away. Can I, can I, can yeah. I say, and also, can I <laughs> add to that? The Spurs chat yeah, where right. Chris is even. Chris, you have to forgive me the location. You was outside of McDonald's. I think we just got, was it beat or we drew in that in that game? Uh, outside there, easily after 10, 11 o'clock. I think even during that time, Chris, it might have been even later in the uh, local time. And out there yeah. still talking Spurs. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't even question the loyalty. No, that's, it's, it's incredible loyalty. You know, up and down the motorways of the UK, um, Going to, you know, godforsaken towns here, well, there even, and everywhere. Yeah, we like Burnley, for example, playing, to go all the way to Chris Burnley like you did. And obviously then the Wrens yeah, and yeah. crazy. It, it, Chris, it, you, you've exactly. done two games. You've done two games in a day before, haven't you? You've done youth games and then first league yeah. games. Yeah. Like do, do, Which, do you know what? The most dedicated I, fan I know. Do you know what? I know you guys are, I, I know I'm completely in a minority about I want to be in the Europa Conference League, but I am really going to miss the European football. I know you guys really want to be out of it, but I'm gutted that we're out because I absolutely love these trips. Uh, br brilliant. Listen, so I've bought yeah. Chris that book and it's a little book that gives you places to stop for something to eat, something for drink away from the service stations up and down the country. So enjoy that, Chris. Uh, well, well done, mate. That's dedication to the cause. And finally, I was uh, tasked with buying a present for uh, David Moyes at West Ham. So uh, not only did I uh, was tasked with it virtually, I've actually bought him his present. Now, you, we know the Scottish do love, uh, and the Scottish are a fine people, by the way, but they love their, their, their food deep fried, don't they? A deep fried Mars bar, a deep fried haggis, anything. If they can put some, if they can put a little bit of something on it, throw it in the fryer, and they're eating it, aren't they? So for you, David Moyes, I have bought you a battered hammer. Look at this. Look, oh it's a hammer God. in batter. I'm going to deep fry that for you. That's because <laughs> hammers get battered everywhere, everywhere they, they go. go. Okay, everywhere there you go. go. So that's for you, David Moyes, a hammer <laughs> in batter. Enjoy. Merry Christmas, West Ham. <laughs> where Take your bow, that? Crackers, that where did you, where'd you go after brilliant. that? Where do you go? Brilliant I've, cracks. I've reached that leaves me on these cliffhangers, and I go, where do I carry on the show from there? I've just, I've got no choice. This is why you know this hosting role is not what it's cracked that to me. I tell you, crack that to me. Get it? Crack that to me. Right. Um, oh, we we must do. We must do before as we close the show now. Um, our Hold player, on. Where's my place? Oh, I'm sorry. Leave the queen. What are you doing here, Rick? Naff off, son. I told you what happened. I've lost control since Trax has got involved. Right, Lee, over to you, mate. That's it, right. So I've got I've got three things, actually, or audience and listeners. Um, and my first one was to buy for the wonderful, the very, very happy tonight, Papa John's new marketing campaigner, Jason McGovern. So I have got, there you go, that is right on cue, a bit of Papa John's action. But what I actually bought, what I actually bought Jason was uh, was some merch, some merchandise. So bear with me. I've got some physical stuff here that I've actually purchased. Now I've just seen you take your hat off. I'm so happy you did because I actually bought you this, which is an upgraded Aww. version of the one that you just had on, and this keeps you your head warm around Christmas time. It's got flashing lights on it, right? Don't worry, mate. You get more presents from me when you get me as your secret Santa. I also bought you a, a own my own design of Last Word on Spurs merchandise. Oh, look, look at that. that. You get your own coffee and, cup, right? And crafted, when you're drinking, come on, you Spurs. Do you get me? Look at that. The cup with that. their name you on the side of it. Last Word on Spurs. And if you get down here, it says, it says on, I've wrote this for you. If it was easy, we wouldn't be Spurs. So there you go, mate. You can there think you about that when you're talking to your trees. And the third one, I'm really pissed off, actually. I'm really, really annoyed because I ordered this ages ago. And because of Christmas, yeah, the deliveries and logistics and all that COVID stuff, it ain't come yet. 
but I can give you breaking news. We're talking about box sets here, and I've got the best one, Jace, for you. It is the box set of all box sets. It is called 18 Months of Jose Mourinho. <laughs> And, it, and it is, it is, it's on its way, mate. So uh, I'll, I'll get it in the post here. Does that um, come for a health warning? Comes for a health warning, mate. Comes for a health warning, especially for Jace. Oh. So that's Jace taking care of three presents there, fella. Um, my, um, the manager that I got, very bizarrely, was uh, Nuno Espirito Santo, um, our, our fa- uh, 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 ill-fated manager, should we say, after four oh, months. Man. Yep. I've given it real thought about this. I thought, you know, should I go for the obvious one, get him some sort of beard treatment, whatever, because he likes to stroke his beard on the sidelines, get him, maybe get him a personality, but I couldn't find I couldn't find it. I didn't want to give him a bit of mind. So what I ended up deciding on is buying him a season ticket just behind the dugout, right, for the rest of the season, so that he can watch Conte ball and know how, how he should have been playing football whilst he was our manager. So that's like why it. I ended up getting Nuno. He's got a season ticket, Right outside, just outside of, uh, of where Conte's sitting, right? That's what I got to Nuno Spirito Santo. And my third and my third present, I'm very, very delighted. This is one of my favourite players. I can't say my, my most favourite player because there's a few, but my, one of my favourite players. I got Hummin Son, the world-class, in my opinion, Hummin Son. Don't give him some stick. The geezer's is absolute Mr Tottenham. And I bought him this. Hopefully, for obvious reasons, this is oh, now that. for Hummin Son to wear under his shirt. So the next, <laughs> when he actually goes and scores two against Chelsea and dumps him out of the uh, Cowboy Cup, he can whip off his shirt and give it some Spider Man. Spider Man, baby. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that, well, am I right, Sam? That's, that's the presence concluded. Um, so to close yeah. the show, we have to, like I say, close it with our player of the year reveal. Now, um, our listeners have been voting. We had over uh, three and a half thousand votes that came in. Um, Hummin Son. The unanimous winner at 54%. Um, second to that was Hugo Lloris at 25%. Pierre Hoybier at 12 Harry came with nine. I just wonder, you know, on the back of Harry's um, situation over the summer, whether that dictated or changed that vote. Now, um, we're going to quickly do it amongst ourselves here, boys, because um, whilst it has been an utter mess of a year of the Spurs as a whole, although in the last eight weeks we have seen slowly are starting to have some positivity amongst the um, the, the, the fans and the team again. Um, Hugo Lloris has been a real consistent player for Tottenham over the course of the last 12 months. And, you know, albeit he's gone through three different managers in the year of 2021. Um, obviously, he attempted to steady the ship for Tottenham. He called the players out. Uh, brutally honest, obviously, rebuke against Zagreb, we saw. Um, and he's one of the few Spurs players that has, you know, really struggled from that dip in form. We then look at someone like Harry Kane. You know, Harry Kane, um, whilst his start to the season has been poor, just the two Premier League goals. And we can't get off, you know, and not look at last season. Of course, Harry won um, the Golden Boot, the Playmaker Award. He scored 14 Premier League goals from January onwards and finished 2021 with another 16 goals for England. But Emil Hoybier, um, you know, arguably now, it's weird. Hoybier, it feels that from what happened with Skip's arrival, that Hoybier is now almost like a shadow of, you know, really that voting process. And, you know, he went on to have a great Euros, of course. He um, When he first started for Tottenham, I think we can all agree that we loved his energy, we loved his leadership, his determination. I think he was probably guilty of being played far too many times over the course of last season with Jose Mourinho. Inevitably, I think as me and you, Ant, probably said on many times on the phone, he got the Spurs sick, right? And uh, like I say, it's one of those where I think with Hoybier now, I mean, you see online, Hoybier, the amount of, Sticky seems to get now from Spurs fans. Listen, some of it maybe feel justified, others not. And then to close it, Hummin Son, of course, it's been a strange 2021 for Son. He didn't manage to hit the heights of the first half of last season, um, but he still finishes the club's Premier League top goal scorer so far um, over the course of the calendar year. Did sign that big new contract. So um, we can go round here and we can put um, hands up if we want. Who will be voting uh, for Hugo Lloris as Spurs' player of the year? For 2021. So we've got John. Oh, we've, got, we've, got, we've, got, we've got Frankie. We've got Jason. We've got John. Rich has put his hand up. Chris has put his hand up. Anthony Costa has put his hand up. So that's... Uh, so that's sorry, just sorry. Jan- can I just say oh, the Frankie, reason I'm do- doing this oh. is I'm, I'm, I'm talking from January 2021 to now. Yep. If it was last season or if Kane had 
performed a little bit better has to be Harry Kane, truly for the fact that no one has done what he's done since 1994, since Andy Cole done it in Newcastle, golden, um, sorry, top goal scorer, golden playmaker award, whatever he's called. That yeah. is an incredible achievement in a Tottenham yeah. team that underachieved. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, Jamie, you're the only one to put your keep your hand down there. Who would yeah. you have Who would you have voted for the Player of the Year out of those other options? Harry Kane, Pierre Mbappé, Hummin Son. Yeah, I, I mean, I was kind of thinking Tongi and Um but uh, <laughs> no, no, of course, of course not. Um, no, um, no, for me, easy Harry Kane. <laughs> for me, easy. <laughs> for me, definitely. I tell you what, Jamie. Tomorrow you're getting a Domino's instead of a Papa's. No, 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 please don't. No, no, no. I actually thought Jason had froze. <laughs> oh, I thought he did. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, boys? I mean, let's say, so, I mean, oh, as, as, a, as a unanimous um, panel here, are we going to say Hugo Lloris, last one on Spurs, player of the year 2021? You can't deny it, Rick. He, yeah, he's, yeah, I think so. Okay. Look, look, yeah, look, at, look at last night. Look at last yeah. night, that game against West Ham. If it wasn't That's for him... We wouldn't yeah. be in the semi-finals. It, it's as simple as that. And, yeah. you know, the whole year, I think he's been so underrated. Yeah. And, you know, dare I mention it again, trophies. You know, at the end of this season, he would have been at the club for 10 years. You know, give the man a trophy. He deserves one. So I'm hoping for his sake, for our sake, all, all of us fans, we deserve trophies. So, you know, do it for Hugo Lloris. He's, he's been absolutely magnificent during this calendar year of 2021. Yeah, and just on Harry Kane quickly, boys, as we look to close the show, um, you know, Frankie picked up on there, you know, Kane, if you're looking at what he contributed last season in terms of goals and assists, he would have probably won this vote hands down. Does he still require some making up to do to the fan base, in our opinions? We've got obviously a semi-final to come. We've got the FA Cup still to come. We're in a top four contention battle here. Can he win us back? I, I thought that I thought his performance against Liverpool and his body and his just his body language as well. I think uh, I think I spoke with Jason about it. Something that I think he's really missed is kind of that that body language in games. He just didn't particularly look interested. But against Liverpool, he just he, you know he was diving in the tackles. You saw what the goal meant to him. Um, so I, I think he's fully committed to Spurs. Uh, I think he's totally committed to us now. Of course, Conte's here, so. Um, yeah, I've got no doubt that Harry Kane will start coming back to his best. I just think it's going to take maybe a couple more moments to get that confidence back. But yeah, no doubt that he's going to, you know, he's going to get back to his top form. Look, we've got Arsenal coming up on the 16th of January. If you want to get back in Tottenham fans' good books, that's the game to do it, H. You know, if you get a couple yeah. of goals in that game, mate, come in, celebrate with the fans. We'll all love you yeah. again. No worries about that. Yeah, find it very interesting. And uh, Hoybier, um third in that vote with the last one on Spurs. Listeners, audience, anyone got any... Uh, any verdicts on Hoybier now? Will he get back into that Spurs eleven on a consistent basis, boys? I, I can't understand that the, the the hate for Hoiber. I, I can't understand it. I literally cannot understand it. I, I, gen, honestly, I'm going to say it again. I cannot understand it. Now this guy has scored a couple of goals already this season. He's uh, he assisted another brilliant goal yesterday with one two um, uh, for our first goal. He's, he's assisted, I think, three goals this season already. When you're looking at that 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 type of player, like a, a Matic type of player uh, that Conte had at Chelsea and played him in that position, he, he's, he scored one goal all season, Matic. Seven assists the whole season. Hoiberg's already got two and a three or whatever I've just said. I, I, I don't get the, the hate for Hoiberg. I just don't get it. I love Skip. Absolutely love him. And I think he's a brilliant footballer. But he ain't assisted anything. And he ain't scored anything either so far. So when you're when you're constantly putting them two up against each other, it doesn't have to be either or. It can be it can be together. They can rotate. Uh, you know, Skip's not going to come in and play fifty two games in a season. He might play yeah. twenty. He might play twenty five, twenty nine. Same with Hoiberg. Just said it yourself. Hoiberg is you know played so many games last season. He was knackered. Why can't you mm. drop him out for a couple of games, play Skippy, and then switch it out and, and move it around? We, we, we just said earlier, right? We've, we've got Boxing Day game on the 26th. Then we've got to play Southampton on the 28th. Then we've got Watford on the 1st. Then we've got Cups coming. You know, f- 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 games coming thick and fast. I don't get why people on social media are, are, are all over Hoy, but I, I don't get it. This, Mate, last year, this, a, is, this is a guy that's a leader. He's a warrior. Mm. He put his body on the line. He'd do everything for the football club. And it's not his job to go and score goals and create goals. As Cracker said many, many weeks ago, he's the dustman. And is he a good dustman? Yes, he is. He's a bloody brilliant one. More than that, Lee. I don't get it. Point we made on last night's show, under Nuno and Mourinho, we was actually asking him to do two positions. 
totally he was, agree he, he was doing that. Crackers, we've run him into the he's ground. Knackered. We've run him, we've into, run the him into the yeah. ground. He's knackered. Yeah. But yet, there he is. He's still wanting to give it. So, you know, cutting some slack. If he has a bit of a drop-off in performances, it's probably his hangover from, from doing two positions under Nuno and, and, and Mourinho. So, like... Totally you know, agree. And, 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 and do you know is. what? And do you know what, lads, listeners, viewers, everyone out there, right? He's probably just had COVID as well. And, I, and we, he's come yeah. back. He's, he's just made an assist, come back after having co- This bloke would run for walls of us. We, we, we talk about we need leaders in the in the team. He's a leader and we yeah. want him out. Are yeah. you having a laugh? Like, sorry, he's, he's been absolutely brilliant for us. And yes, he's, he's dropped off uh, uh, this season, which is why we're looking at calendar year, which is why I put my hand up for Hugo. But yep. the, all the reasons we've just talked about, I, I think he's. He, I'm sorry, I'm passionate about Hoiberg because I, I like him, and he ain't done anything wrong. He, yeah, he's, you know as well for, for that Liverpool game, he wasn't even on the bench, but he still, he still sat on the bench alongside all the subs. He wanted to be involved. He's one of the leaders within that group. And you know, this season under Antonio Conte so far, it's got to be about players taking the opportunities. And this last week, I tell you what, it's a perfect time to do this show because. It's so positive. You, you, you've seen every player that Antonio Conte has given an opportunity to, they have grabbed it. And, you know, we have spoken so many times on this uh, channel, on, on this show, you know, in the last couple of years about players taking the opportunities and they haven't. You know, you think what Antonio Conte has done in seven weeks in charge as Tottenham Hotspur head coach. I can't wait to see what he's going to do in seven months, you know, yeah. after a January transfer window, a summer Man. transfer window. I have never, ever been so excited mm. about a managerial position you know, appointment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end, you know, what I'm going to say by just saying the trophies are coming 100% <laughs> because it, they have to. Under Antonio Conte, if he's truly backed, you know, he, he is energised his squad, he has energised all of us fans. We are all smiling again. If you get Jason uh, McGovern smiling, you know, you're onto a good thing. Chris, we were, oh, saying, we were saying a few of us were obviously at the game yesterday and a few of the lads, uh, oh, sorry, Jason was on mute. A few, a few of the lads were, um, uh, you know, we were chatting and whatever. And we, we were saying that, you know, Antonio Conte is like, is like brought back the Potticino yep. feeling, but with the trophies. Do you know what I mean? And you'll love that because the trophies are coming. But do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's what it feels like. It feels like yep. the Potticino, the good feeling that we had under Poch, has come back so quickly. Uh, Maybe it's because we were so low that actually, uh, yeah. you know, seven weeks he's been here. I, I feel though so much more. Pre- I feel so much more prepared now. And it's no offense to Poch, but going to that battle, with that bridge, the bridge uh, Chelsea game now. I know with Conte in charge now, I feel so much prepared for what is going to come our way. That Put I know I've got a manager. Up. Put your hand up, everyone. Just quick round robin. Do you think we go through the yes. semi final? Yeah. Yes, I'll tell you why. Because the first the first leg's at the bridge, the second leg is back at the spur, at our, our home. So we know exactly what we need to do when we bring it back to our also, place. Football's also very poetic in a sense that the former manager always tends to go back. Obviously, given the right tools, you can't just have a, a Sunderland-type squad, but the former manager always tends to go back and beat the club that sacked him. Yeah. So there's, a, there's an element of that. But just touching on Conte, the one thing that uh, is, stands out for me is the fact that it's almost like a two-pronged attack of what he's done to the club or in the sense that he's getting the extra percentages out of the players on the pitch. Um, he's kicking the ball with them. He's in the game. He's, he's the 12th man on the pitch, but he's also getting the crowd up. So he's yeah. orchestrating the, the players oh, yeah. and he's also orchestrating the crowd. I've never seen that from a Spurs manager before where he's physically getting the crowd up and he's doing the same with the team. And um, we, we're all unanimous. The whole fan base, I haven't yeah. seen this in my lifetime anyway. Perhaps Crackers or Jason might have, but in the managerial appointment, the whole fan base being this excited, not one fan saying this is a bad appointment or no. I'm a bit sceptical. No. It's a complete, as I said, it's a whitewash, isn't it, in opinion? Yeah, but yeah. we all believe in Conte and where this club is going under Conte. And I haven't had that in my lifetime yet. And, and I'm very happy to have it. Just, just and, another. Just well, another. Oibier was, Oibier was doing exactly the same at the end of the game last night. Yeah. No, just another thing. I thought for one thing from the game last night, I wasn't actually there, but I thought the atmosphere towards the end when the team were kind of maybe struggling a bit towards the end, the whole stadium kind of last, really last made it a really difficult atmosphere. And I think <clears throat> that's something the stadium's really missed, kind of the whole crowd really fighting with the team. And uh, I think that's because everyone believes in the manager now. You, I, yeah, I, I, I can tell you. Anything, as well as we're excited to go I back to say, the, the stadium after the game, well, obviously everyone's buzzing, right? But... I don't know um, how how many of you was there yesterday, or whatever. There's a lot of people, obviously, with COVID worries and so on and so forth. 
But that long bar yesterday was absolutely banging. And, oh, and yeah. for a lot of people that are, oh, we don't want to sing the songs and this, that, and the other, I've been crying out for songs that are clean. I don't want to hear the Y word songs. I'm putting it out there now. This is our channel. I'm allowed to say this. I do not want to hear the Y word songs. I think yeah. they're offensive to other people. I don't want to hear the swearing songs. I've got children that go to the football matches and so on and so forth in the South Stand as well. So whatever, they want to sing, they want to have fun, they want to be energetic mm -hmm. and have fun and blah, 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 right? So we needed some we needed some new songs or whatever. The Over and the Spurs stuff and all that uh, all that kind of stuff is, is fantastic and brilliant. But that that um, Olay song that uh, that James is, uh, has, has adapted, and it, it, by all accounts, I know it's just a Liverpool song or, you know, whatever, and they, they were singing it all over Madrid when we were travelling uh, for the Champions League final. But that, that song that they've adapted to the mayonnaise and the ketchup, that absolutely went off yesterday in the long bar. And I have to say, it was clean, fun, and absolutely brilliant. And it was, and the atmosphere was was superb. And I, I you know, I listened to the show yesterday, Crackers, when you're talking about creating an atmosphere, and like it has to, it has to come all together, and you can't mm. invent it. And, mm -hmm. I, and I do agree with that. Um, but I did chuckle to myself as I was walking my dog this morning, listening, because he kept saying atmosphere, atmosphere. And all I was thinking of is Ru Russ Abbott. Oh, what an atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could, you could, you could sing that down the stands. <laughs> See how you get over that one, I tell you. Rick, like I said last night, under Nuno, under Mourinho, Chelsea away, how would oh, you be feeling as a fan? I, I would not even want to turn up. We would have lost last night under those shoes. Yeah, we would be in the yeah, semis under those shoes. We would have given away two now? goals at the boys, end. Boys, when that exactly. draw came out against West Ham, when that draw came out against West Ham, the, we were all crapping it, weren't we? Yeah. All of us were. And then before the game last night, we are all going, but you know what? All right, fancy this. I yeah, proper fancy absolutely. this. If we do what we've done versus Liverpool tonight, I quite fancy this and we've done it. And it's the same as Chelsea. And that is, that's all you need as a check and balance in this is yep. how you feel as a fan, your perception yep. going into it. And if you fancy going to Chelsea away, like I do and like many do, then you've got something going on. You've got something yeah, cooking. Yeah. Absolutely. Would, would, would there be a better way to win a trophy? You know, you know, losing that trophy drought as well. You know, by beating our London rivals, West Ham, Chelsea, yeah. and then playing Arsenal in a final. Can you imagine it? Can you just imagine that happening? Yeah. It'd be incredible. Imagine yeah. that Conte would be like almost, there'd be a statue of him within, yeah. <laughs> within weeks. <laughs> Jay's pulled it a couple of shows ago when he said yeah. the best way to go and win that would be to beat West Ham, to beat Chelsea, and to beat Arsenal along the way. And you said it tonight on the show. I've, I absolutely agree. I think it would be absolutely phenomenal. And and uh, was it the Kieran Trippier own goal at Chelsea when when we went out? Was that in yeah, the Cup, yeah. that in the Cup as well? No, that was oh, a Premier League. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But yeah. It, it was a season, wasn't it, that we went out to them where they the away goal rule didn't count. I mean, this is classic. No, it was penalties. I was there. I was there. Was it the yeah, yeah, yeah Mr. Yeah, Penalty. Lucas. The other end to where the away fans were. Yeah. In the yeah. Tier, yeah. It shouldn't yeah. have gone a penalty, should it? Because we had an away goal and all that. And it was yeah. they changed the rule. They changed the rule that. that year. Yeah. We, we, do, we do owe them. Um, and we do owe Arsenal uh, a, a beating as well. So, yeah. uh, to be fair, we owe Liverpool a beating also. So, it won't yeah. really matter. I think, you know, to go and win that, no one will sit there and banter us for winning the Cowboy Cup if we've beaten West Ham, yeah. Arsenal, Chelsea or Liverpool on the way. No. Like, they just won't. But it's no. going to be really tough. And that's why, coming back to the whole, you know, you uh, you have a conference league piece. I, I don't even know where we'd fit the fixtures in. I know we've done that to death on loads of different shows. Chris Callan's show as well as last week. Yep. But yep. You know, I think, I did generally think Leicester beat us to the title. They had no European football. Chelsea beat us to the title. They had no European football. There's t there's teams in and around us at the moment, like Arsenal, for God, or God forbid, that have got no European football. So, so actually, get us to concentrate on these games, and we can be fresh yeah. for them. And, and we get and, Saturday football back, lads and, and listeners and, and, the, and viewers. The thing is, Lee, the the Carabao Cup final, whoever we'd subject to beating Chelsea, obviously Arsenal and Liverpool will have their feet up all week, and it's Europa Conference League second leg on the Thursday, just two days before the final. I mean, can't do it. You don't yeah. want to be playing two days before a final when the other lot are all sitting there with their feet up watching. We've had yeah. that problem before. Jay, do you reckon, said... lads, do you reckon we will get the, the 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 credit that we would hopefully deserve if we beat 
obviously Chelsea and then Arsenal or Liverpool in the yeah. final because I think you yeah. know what it's like, lads. You know what it's like. We're gonna get yeah, but like we played our second team or we played our. Do you know what I mean? And you think, but the thing is, and will we ever get that? Just so, what I mean. Seven weeks ago, seven weeks ago, we weren't even recording a shot on target, and yeah, now we're, mad, we're, we're mad. challenging for the top four, and we're in a semi-final of a, a major competition. So, you know, this is what I mean about Antonio Conte turning this uh, this club oh, yeah. around in seven yeah, weeks. I, I, listen, I'm in I'm I'm agreement with you. I'm just saying, as as a fan base, would we get that credit that we, we would hopefully I, deserve if we went and won it? Yeah, I, I think, think we, we will. Win. I think. They'll play, for, they'll, they'll play their strong teams, though. I think a lot of them will play. Chelsea will play their strongest team, I think, against Spurs. I think Arsenal would, too. I think Liverpool will, as well. I think, you know, when it comes to the teams that are left in the competition now, I'll be really surprised if these teams aren't going to put out their most strongest available team. Chase, what do you think, mate? I don't think we will get the credit. Uh, but then if we win the league, it'll be, well, you've, you ain't won the Champions League. That, that's yeah, how it is. That's that's, that's how football supporters are. That's it. That's it. You know, that's and if you've won the Champions League, yeah, but you can win it once, but you have to go and do it again. You know, yeah. Liverpool have won five and things like yeah. that. So, you know, no no team's ever going to give us credit, are they? But for yeah, ourselves right. to knock those three teams out, the three yeah. the three noisiest ones, you know, to just to do those three, and we know that if they beat us in it, they'll be full of it as well. So, you know, who cares if they don't rate it? Yeah, it's exactly. Been the London derbies, like we've had a debacle, haven't we? Already this, or other than yesterday. Now, of course, I mean, got ripped by Chelsea, ripped by Arsenal, ripped by Palace. I mean, this is absolutely, you know, like Chris, well, like you're saying, the turnaround that that, that Conte's done is is just unbelievable. It's transformational. I mean, but he kept talking about he's not a magician. We kept singing uh, his magic, you know, Pochettino. Well, hang on a minute. We should we should we not be singing say, magic about Conte? Because I actually do think he is a magician. I literally can't believe well, Ben Davies is an outstanding player. I'm saying, Lee Frank said it. Think, if you can make these players that all right, we put on the shelf last season. Your winkses, you're this, you're that. This player, that player. If he can make them better players, my word, he deserves a proper medal. Am I yeah, right? What could he do if we back him? Imagine if we give oh, him his own saying. players who are better quality than what we've got. Can you imagine? Absolutely. Does it really matter though what no, other mean... what other teams fans think about us winning the Carabao Cup if we did? Because <gasps> over the last few years of, of me going to the Etihad Stadium, you know, clearly outside, uh, you know, on the Etihad Stadium, it says Premier League winners and it says Carabao Cup winners. It is equal billing to Premier League. You know, yeah, they're, they're very right. proud of winning the competition. Absolutely. What I'm trying to say is, is that us Spurs, we never ever get the the credit that no. we that we deserve. Sometimes, only, yeah, we have, we have, only, we have some shockers, it's true, but it winds me up. You know, if, if, if Leicester, I applaud Leicester when they won it. Oh, fair play to you. Do you know what I mean? I know a few Leicester fans, good luck to you, but we never ever get that credit. Where hold on a minute, you know, we've come from we've had that, we've had lasagna gate, we've had lost the last minute of a game and we didn't get four. Do you know what I mean? We've always had bad luck against us, and it's the Spursy thing that we talk about, yeah. We can't. Now, man. We can't. All, um, all, all I say is we can't think it's cracked yet because we we're on a good run. Yeah. But we had Leeds at home. We had Brentford at home. We had Norwich at home. We had Liverpool at home. We had West Ham at home, and we'll have Palace at home. So when have we ever had six home games in a row? So yeah. you know, I, I want to see us Southampton away. Watford away and particularly Chelsea away. Let's see what we're like it's away from game. home before we think he's changed the complete thing. And, and then if we can start getting well. results away from home, then we're on, then we're on the right way. It's a really good point, but it's, it's actually quite a good couple of away game run before we go to Chelsea. Like Southampton away and Watford away. Again, without being disrespectful, I mean, I just say me, but I expect to win them games, right? I expect to go to Southampton and win, and I expect to go to Watford and win. So, actually, to get, I think you're spot on to get them away games under our belt before we go to Chelsea away. Hopefully, look, I totally expect to be going into that Chelsea game uh, with another three wins under our belt before we go to Chelsea. That is my yeah. full expectation. And I could not say that seven weeks ago. That is phenomenal. Uh, that's yep. a big compliment you can play three, to, man. Three, three words for you, Jace. The Conte effect. The trophies uh, are coming. And I think on that basis, that is where we shall leave things. And everybody's on over the course of the next few weeks. So, And there's lots of games in store 
and lots of excitement to come. Um, the show, of course, is all about our wonderful listeners um, that tune into the show week after week, minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day. So I'm going with Jace. Uh, literally, thank you so much, guys, for all of your incredible support over the course of the last 12 months and over the course of the last four or five years. It's um, as Chris will tell you, and as the boys will tell you, and John knows it as well now, running a, um, you know, if it's a, if it's a podcast, if it's a YouTube channel, it takes up so much of your time. And uh, listen, it takes a lot of um, sacrifice from family members uh, to keep everybody sweet. And um, like I say, it's uh, it can be testing, but we do our best to try and make it happen. So um, like I say, Frankie, thank you so much. Lovely to have you back on. Frankie, I know you're trying to get to as many uh, home and away games as possible now. So um Frankie, always a pleasure. Love to have you on board as well. Thanks, thanks, guys. This is the biggest one I've done so far. It's nice to have everyone on together before Christmas. Um, thanks to all the listeners. Thanks to all you guys for making me feel so welcome being back on this year after my pleasure. hiatus. Uh, Merry Christmas to everyone. Stay, stay safe. Uh, hopefully, I'll see as many of you over there on Boxing Day as possible. And come on, you Spurs. I love it. Um, on our top right, Jamie, lovely to have you on. Jamie, I've had loads of people coming in asking about uh, transfers. Do you just want to throw us up for Jason's sake? Give us a few names before you let us go. Come on, Jamie. Who we, who's in Jamie? Who have we been linked with? Come on, give us a few yeah, names. Yeah, oh, I mean, we could do a completely whole new show if you want me to get my full list of... Uh, we are two and a half hours in, two and a half, 20 no, minutes. I've really, I think I've really, with my jumper and uh, my Don Malay play of the season, I think I've wound Jason up enough, so I'll, I'll, I'll save him with that. But... Um, yeah, no, Merry Christmas to kind of all the listeners, to all you boys. Um, and yeah, just really, really excited to be watching Spurs again. I think it's just, you know, fantastic time to be a Spurs fan again. So, uh, yeah, just looking forward to bo the Boxing Day again. Uh, come on, you Spurs. Absolutely. Jace, it's been lovely to have you back on board as well. Um, now, obviously, we've got, uh, obviously, a, a serial winner in charge. And uh, I know you're really enjoying these uh, these lengthy shows. So thank you so much, Jace. Cheers, boys. Have a good one. I'm off for a beer now. And a beer and a shot. <laughs> oh, John, John, mate, lovely to have you back on. John, obviously, uh, the youth pods are still coming thick and fast. Where can we find them, John? Please enable us and let us know. Yeah, just on any podcast provider, at Lee White underscore Rose. Absolute pleasure to be back on tonight, guys. Really appreciate it. Great panel. Great to talk to Big Tom Uddleston, proper Tottenham legend. And yeah, listeners, thanks so much for tuning in over the years. And uh, look forward to dropping some more shows over the coming months. Come on, you Spurs. And uh, like I say, taking it over to my uh, co-host, the uh, leader of our Conte Crazy Train, Lee McQueen. Lee, mate, it's uh, been a journey, right? Been a journey. It's been a, it's been a crazy journey, isn't it? 2021, uh, as was 2020. But uh, we still will keep going. I'm pumping. Coal used to be pu pumping into that, that that engine. Don't need to do it anymore. It's just smooth sailing all, almost. Hopefully, we get another fantastic win. I'll be down there, like Frankie, I'll be down there on, the, on Boxing Day. Uh, be my last game uh, of the calendar year because I'm uh, I'm off on my holidays after that. So uh, yeah, come and say hello if you see us. I'm in uh, block two five two, um, and uh, yeah, Merry Christmas to everybody, all the listeners and uh, and the viewers, and obviously to you lot because you are my new family. You like my new yeah, Spurs yeah. family, you lot, and I love Lem it, mate. So thanks yeah. ever so much for having me uh, all, all the time and listening to my waffle on every week. We love it. We love it. Bottom left. Mr. Richard Cracknell uh, saved my life at one point during the year where I needed that break and I came back to Nuno Espirito Santo. So uh, I appreciate it, Rich. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Rick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Listen, Merry Christmas to everybody that tunes in. Ricky, Jamie, John, uh, Chris especially. You don't know the work that these guys put into bringing you content. It is like, you know, you see the swan on the top of the water and these people are those paddling feet underneath. Absolutely I'm, a, I'm that one that's drowned at the moment. Out. <laughs> but or listen, being drowned. Rick, I, you know, I get messages from people that say, uh, you know, I live on my own and it's this and it's that and lockdown and everything that's gone on and they say, the content like from the show and that is just incredible and it helps keep me sane and I get a sense of being with people on these shows. That's special, you know, like, you know, that, that's all well, one or two Absolutely. messages like that from people that yep. just say like, thanks, because this is keeping me sane, what yep. you're putting out. Brilliant. Like, yep. you know, if you're doing that, that's everything. That is absolutely everything. So like, well I, done. I cheer everyone up, you boys. 
Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you Cheer know, everyone if, up. If, if if people are even getting cheered up by Jason, wow. I mean, you know, but that that's that's really special. So I just want to miss, wish everybody a really merry Christmas, happy New Year, wherever you're with. Keep safe and well, and uh, thank you everybody for like all your lovely feedback uh, to the show and all the guests. It's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, handing over to Chris Calner, I must make an admission, it's been mightily tough and I have to take personal responsibility for this, for not getting trying to get Chris on more as what I would love to this season. Um, we've got Chris booked up for quite a few shows in January, like February, March, we've got coming as well. So, um, Chris, lovely to have you back on. You do run, like I say, uh, you know, as like me, you know, a, a channel that um, takes up a lot of effort, time, uh, dedication, commitment. And uh, I know as we, as, I know as well as me, you feel that strain sometimes. So um, thank you so much for making the time tonight on the back of nearly two and a half hours. I do owe you one. It's been lovely having you on. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I tell you what, I think that all nine of us should do regular shows like this with all of us on absolutely. because it's been absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And it's been yeah, great right. to uh, meet up with a lot of you guys as well, um, you know, during 2021, you know, do some great shows on, on here. Of course, a lot of you come on my channel on a regular basis as well. So I really appreciate all your time uh, and support of my channel. And uh, yeah, it's been great. It's uh, But Ricky, you, you and I and, uh, you know, some of the others on, on this uh, on this chat now, we do it because we absolutely adore our club and we want success. And hopefully yeah. that will come very, very soon. Amen. And when it does come, Chris, we will also have a massive joint party. My God, what a party that is going off. I tell you, unbelievable. To finish with the man that I know many are saying to me, Whenever a show goes out, where is he? What, 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 where's Andy Costa tonight? Where is he? Can we get him on? Can we bring him on? Especially if we, if we, if someone needs a telling off, I'm getting messages saying, "Where is he? Can we bring him on?" <laughs> <laughs> he got, he got named Rantony, 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 and no, I know you've got obviously a big 22, 2022 coming up for you personally as well. Lots going on. I have, boys. I have listened uh, on, a, on a personal note. Thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for for making me feel a part of this this show. Um, you boys, when we met up, we had such a laugh and long may it continue. Let's do it next year. Um, Rich, get your backside off from Lanzarote. Make sure you come to London. Um, and I am walking in a Winksy Wonderland. Not yet, though, Jace. Not yet, mate. Um, <laughs> Let's not get too carried away, boys. He's had two good games. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, and listen, I love you boys to death. And uh, yeah, thank you for making me feel part of it. Listeners, viewers, thank you for all the, all the banter, all the good comments and having a Christmas. Stay safe and uh, we'll see you in the new year. Amen. Oh, I will echo those words uh, from out there. Like I say, we're wishing you all a very Merry Christmas from Frankie, from Jamie, from Jason, from John, from Lee, from Crackers, from Chris. From Anthony, from myself, guys, have a wonderful Christmas, healthy and happy new year. Uh, we are back with you on Boxing Day to review Tottenham Hotspur against Crystal Palace, where Spurs are hopefully picking up another three points. Guys, have a wonderful Christmas day. And as always, come on, you Spurs. Come on, you Spurs.